What is up, everybody? John the Morgyle here, uh, doing a video response to uh, one of the most appalling, despicable displays of vulgar ignorance and just sheer globe-headedness and stubbornness um, that I've really seen in a long time, crammed into 15 minutes. So, I mean, that really says a lot when you can get that much liaria and uh, ignorance crammed into 15 minutes. Um, the, the reason I'm doing this is a, a friend of mine, Jason, texted me today and asked me if I had seen the, uh, the debate last night, uh, which would have been Monday, January the 23rd, uh, on Jaronism Raw between Jaronism and uh, Zachary K. Hubbard, which, um, you know, I told my friend Jason I had not. I actually still haven't seen the debate. Um, and honestly, I, I wasn't really too familiar with Zachary K. Hubbard. Uh, the name sort of rings a bell, right? It sort of rang a bell, but I haven't seen his work, never spoken with him, not familiar with him. And so um, what I did do is I just sort of checked him out on YouTube, and the first video that I found of his was this uh, uh, called The Delusional Flat Earth Community, Afterthoughts on Jaronism Debate about the Flat Earth PSYOP. And I'll put a link to that in the descriptions, as well as a link to the uh, to the debate that he had with Jaron. I'll first off, you know, I'll say that I feel sorry for people like Zachary K. Hubbard uh, because they are unable to humor theories or consider hypotheses that are outside of what they believe uh, due to stubbornness and due to uh, essentially a lifetime of programming uh, mandated by the federally run school system, by the school curriculum. And so, you know, it's uh, the, the major PSYOP, the terrible deception, the huge mother of all PSYOPs actually is the, the whole heliocentric Copernican principle, Big Bang el evolution theory uh, theories. I mean, those are the PSYOPs that have been implanted into our uh, ID, you know, into our psyche since we were very young children, and that's that's a real shame. Now, the beauty of it is uh, is that uh, our generation has been blessed uh, with this revelation uh, that there is actually another way of looking at things than the Copernican principle. Because to be very honest, the, the Copernican theory, uh, which scientists throughout history do have a bent towards, it is a law of physics, this Copernican principle, this mediocrity principle, this law that states that uh, the Earth must not hold any special or significant or unique or even uh, remotely uh, significant place in the universe, that is a law of physics. And so by, by definition, theoretical physicists have a bent towards the opposite of science because science is supposed to entail uh, humoring uh, different hypotheses to see which uh, better match reality and the way that you do this is to uh, is through experiments and uh, following data following the facts where they lead you and unfortunately theoretical physics based on a Copernican principle is the opposite of science because uh, people like Zachary Hubbard just simply refuse to consider uh, theories that are outside of their scope of reality. Now um, I will get to rolling this clip and rebutting uh, Zachary Hubbard as I, you know, as we go along. Um, but I will say that uh, one of the toughest things to get across to people is not uh, flat Earth. Um, one of my specialities is disproving the heliocentric model. I mean, it's really quite easy to do. And so if you can prove that the Earth isn't a spinning sphere in outer space, then is it really necessary to even prove flat Earth? Or should we, you know, just take that, uh, the total debunking of the heliocentric model as at least a starting point to start looking at other ideas, to start looking at other hypotheses? I mean, even if one single premise of the heliocentric model is debunked, then the rest of it falls. I mean, it all rides on, you know, every bit of the heliocentric theory, whether it's, uh, axial rotation, 
the precession of the equinoxes, the speed of the spin at the equator, allegedly, uh, the cycle of the moon. I mean, all of this stuff has to be precisely what they say it is, and if one single thing is shown to be false, uh, then the rest of it falls apart. Um, now, that's the beautiful thing about the flat Earth reality, is it's very plain and simple. The Earth is just is simply a stationary plane, and um, we flat Earthers don't claim to know what the stars are. And uh, frankly, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, you may not know this, uh, talking to people like Zachary K. Hubbard, but you don't know what the stars or the sun are either. Now, you claim to believe in a theoretical thing called hot atomic fusion which has never been demonstrated in a lab. It is theoretical. And so for you to say that you know that the sun and the stars are hot atomic fusion is ridiculous. Um, hot atomic fusion only exists in the realm of theory. In fact, if you look at the evidence, even atomic fission or an atomic bomb, uh, such a thing exists merely in the realm of theory and propaganda. And the only thing that we have that is uh, realistic in terms of nuclear uh, which is a misnomer, is nuclear energy, uh, which I've touched on this in other videos, but you're merely taking a radioactive isotope, encasing it into a small area which creates heat, that energy is transferred to boil water, and then the steam turns a turbine, so you just have a very expensive advanced form of steam power, there's no splitting of theoretical atoms involved at all. And so I, I guess what I'm getting at is um, most of what we were taught in school in terms of theoretical physics, uh, everything from the atom to the atom bomb to the planet Jupiter to the sun and how it was formed and how galaxies were formed and how dark matter you know, theoretically holds galaxies together, all the way back to the Big Bang and everything in between, including evolution, all of that is uh, conjecture. And um, all of that is backed by nothing more than circumstantial evidence, confirmation bias, and a world full of people who were tricked since they were toddlers into believing in the most absurd, preposterous thing, uh, uh, such as you live stuck to the side of a spinning sphere in a vacuum of outer space. So let's get started on this video. I'm going to uh, roll this button, and I may end up uh, cutting in some other clips as well of uh, Zachary K. Hubbard's genius. Uh, sarcasm there. Hey, true seekers, welcome back. Zach here. Last night, Monday, January 23rd, 2017, I went on Jaronism's radio program to have a discussion about the flat earth which I maintain is a psychological operations meant to divide, distract, and discredit the truth community. Wow. Okay, so you're, you're going to take the position that the Flat Earth is a PSYOP. Okay, let's just say hypothetically, for argument's sake, I'm not asking you to be a Flat Earther, I'm just saying hypothetically for argument's sake, let's just say that it's true. Let's just say that the Earth isn't actually a spinning sphere in outer space, but it is indeed a stationary plane. No curvature, no axial rotation, no orbiting, no galactic frame of reference, no Big Bang, none of that. Um, let's just suppose, for argument's sake, that that is all theory, which indeed it is. All of that is uh, theory. And let's just suppose, for argument's sake, that Flat Earth happens to be true. For you to say that that, that is a PSYOP is the most ironic, close-minded, it would be comical were it not so sad, uh, situation I've ever seen. It's hard to find an analogy to, to show the, the level of uh, cognitive dissonance and just refusal to look at evidence 
and refusal to follow the scientific method and yet call others who are following the scientific method science denying idiots um, it's, it's preposterous but let's just assume that it's true let's assume that the earth is flat and stationary and we're right let's just say hypothetically that you're wrong about this um, then the psyop is definitely the the whole idea of this heliocentric Copernican principle Big Bang model where the universe in quotes is uh, governed by gravity and chaos and mere chance and life itself uh, essentially uh, was one point uh, inanimate soup made out of minerals that sprang into existence somehow writing billions of lines of DNA code to form even a single cell organism. Um, that makes perfect sense. Yet, um, w when you do start to look at the evidence objectively and start to consider that perhaps you may have been fooled about everything starting with the Big Bang, uh, you know, leading to the formation of stars, planets in general, um, the lights in the night sky, that's all the first-hand evidence you have of space. Now, there has been a huge propaganda campaign going on for our entire lives, really since the early 50s, uh, to indoctrinate people into this uh, really firm belief in infinite space and alien worlds and that the Earth is just this insignificant spinning rubble pile, you know, in some galaxy, uh, one of billions of galaxies, making us uh, the definition of insignificant, uh, which really leads to a line of thought that is... Um, uh, sort of nihilistic, if you will, you know, meaning that uh, nothing has any meaning. In fact, I, I would argue that the heliocentric model and, and the, everything that comes with, with it is the root cause of nihilism itself, if you want to know the truth. And, um, you know, although I do identify as a Christian and I have my entire life, I've held atheistic viewpoints my entire life simply because I have adhered to the uh, standard scientific models of things for the majority of my life. Now, in the last two years, I've happened to look at evidence objectively. Two simple things, and we, and I know you argue this, is uh, the lack of curvature and the lack of axial rotation. Um, these two things alone, you know, debunk the heliocentric model, regardless of what you think the stars in the southern skies are doing. Um, if there is no curvature, then the lights in the night sky are not what we've been told. Uh, we're not on a planet spinning around a galaxy like all the other uh, lights in the night sky. Um, even if the moon is a sphere, for example, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Earth is a sphere whatsoever. That's um, circumstantial evidence. It's a leap of confirmation bias. And, you know, when you do test for curvature, uh, it doesn't exist. When you, t when you make uh, physical experiments, uh, test for axial rotation. Oh, I see that one. I thought that was going straight down. No, a little over this way. Oh! <laughs> that was awesome. You know, supersonic axial rotation uh, at the equator and even in the United States, uh, it simply doesn't exist. Uh, so the fact is that you are indeed wrong, and uh, the fact that you claim that Flat Earth is a PSYOP is, again, it's very ironic, sad, ridiculous, and um, it, it makes me wonder about you, um, and I, I really hope that you're able to really put the lens over the heliocentric model really scrutinize your belief systems because again if if one single uh tenet or premise of the heliocentric model is shown to be fallacious uh, especially when nasa is caught faking just about everything from their inception you know starting with the nazi origins of nasa uh, leading up to the faked apollo hoax missions then on into the uh, faked pioneer 10 uh, missions uh, unmanned mission to jupiter allegedly traveling almost 400 million miles through 90 million miles of errant asteroids through the asteroid belt and beaming back pictures what are uh, obvious hoaxes of this planet Jupiter that uh, you know this is what NASA has been up to and this is what they're still up to raking in 20 billion dollars a year now from taxpayer money alone uh, for planned trips to Mars that will never happen 
Uh, it's always in the next 20 years. They were planning trips to Mars since they, they've been they've they've had that shtick since the 70s and the 80s. So what makes you think they're gonna you know take your ass to Mars? I mean it's ridiculous. So anyway, I just want to let you know a, a psyop, a psychological operation uh, from the government is going to be something that is going to have a, an end result that the government wants. Now, you claim that that end result is to muddy the waters of the truth movement. Now, let's just suppose that, that the Earth is actually flat and stationary. Now, how could that truth, this ultimate truth, how could this truth be muddying the waters of any truth movement? Um, this is a, uh, the greatest deception uh, of the entire world and it really does encompass and house all of the other deceptions you know everything from the Freemasons and the Illuminati running the world through the uh, Vatican the Washington DC and the city of London Citadel city-states you know the trifecta of power you may include Israel in there as well um, you know th these entities th this sort of uh, maritime admiralty corporation that's running the world through sort of inverted fashion or corporate fascism, corpo fascism, um, th these entities, the last thing that they want is an aware, awake public. And when people wake up to the fact that the Earth is at a spinning sphere and all of theoretical science, including Einstein and all of his bizarre theories of space and time being an intermesh fabric of nothing, um, all of this is, is uh, malarkey. And, um, you know, Einstein was pushed and, and promoted sort of like the uh, Backstreet Boys or like a boy band as this uh, genius. When, in fact, you know, he was a, uh, he was a patent clerk. He, he dropped out of high school. He was known to beat his wife. Um, he was known, you know, people that knew him uh, claimed his teachers, his uh, people that knew him uh, claimed that he was no genius. Uh, he merely stole other people's ideas as his, uh, during his time as a patent clerk and took credit for them. Uh, but that's besides the point. Um, it, it really just goes to show that um, this truth, this flat earth truth, as crazy as it sounds, I know how stupid it sounds, trust me, when you realize that your entire education has been one large deception, then uh, people like yourself claiming that this is a psyop to steer people away from the truth is the most preposterous, ridiculous thing. And in fact, if there is government involvement with the Flat Earth Movement, it would be people holding your position, uh, which would be people trying to hold uh, others back from looking at the evidence. Um, I'm not asking anyone to be a Flat Earther. I'm simply asking people to look at the evidence objectively, and I don't mean Wikipedia, the Flat Earth Society, and find some preposterous, ridiculous malarkey like gravity is caused by the Earth uh, accelerating upward at 9.8 meters per second. Um, that's the sort of uh, ridiculous red herring bullshit arguments that misinformation campaigns come up with in order to discredit the truth. Now the fact is what goes up must come down isn't argued by flat earthers however it is the theory of Einsteinian gravity as a warping of space-time that causes what goes up to come down. Now in the flat earth model whether you're aware of this or not the ultimate uh, cause for what goes down is in fact the natural laws of density and buoyancy. Uh, so higher density objects will tend down, while lower density gases and objects like helium will tend up. And uh, there still must be a nudge uh, for density and buoyancy to work. Another example would be a thousand ton ship floating on water, or a uh, fairly heavy airplane flying through the air, or a hot air balloon raising in the air. This is all governed by density and buoyancy. It has nothing to do with gravity. Now, in order for density and buoyancy to work, you have to have a tendency for higher density objects to find their way down, and that uh, that tendency is not gravitic. It's actually electromagnetic. Okay, and uh, this has recently been discovered uh, and, and sort of uncovered and explained by a few people, one of them being uh, Bob Nodell. And the way that I understand it is that, the, and I've understood this for quite a while, that the Earth is a capacitor plate. Um, this is something that Nikola Tesla was talking about uh, ages ago. Uh, but the Earth is a capacitor plate. It holds a static electric charge. And uh, static electric charge is always an attractant charge, sort of like a 
magnetic charge. However, uh, static electric charge is always attractant, and you have uh, electric potential in proportion with altitude, which I believe is 100 volts per meter. And that is exactly the nudge that you need for gravity, uh, or that nudge for density and buoyancy to allow for denser objects to find their way down and less dense objects to find their way up. So, you know, the point is we do have scientific, rational explanations for lots of things in the flat Earth model. However, we, uh, the best of us, or, you know, the most honest of us, refuse to speculate. Um, for example, I refuse to say that there's a dome in the sky. There may be. I don't think that there is. I haven't seen evidence for it, but I'll leave that possibility open. Now, we are certainly allowed to uh, speculate or theorize, uh, but when we're talking about debates, you know, flat versus sphere, we don't want to get into too much speculation. We want to stick to basics. And again, curvature and axial rotation are, are two very basic uh, ones that, um, based on some of the arguments that I've seen you make, you're uh, really basing this on uh, how light is reaching your eye, especially over like 50 or 60 miles miles away, which technically should be impossible on a sphere. We'll get into your video. I'll stop with my little rant here. But, you know, how dare you call the truth a uh, distraction from the truth? I mean, that's so ridiculous. Um, your ignorance of this topic is a distraction of the truth. And you are uh, spreading your ignorance and uh, getting in the way of the truth. Uh, by spreading your ignorance and y you know you need to really look into this a little bit more deeply before you go uh, spouting off at the mouth and uh, calling people liars and disingenuous uh, psyop psychological operation Jaronism last night defended why he thought the flat earth was relevant from my perspective the conversation it, it just reinforced what i already knew it seems to me that the flat earth believers cannot be reached because they make the choice to ignore reality <laughs> Wow, that is the most redonkulous thing I have ever heard in my entire life. You're essentially claiming that flat earthers are denying the truth, denying what's plain and obvious and right in front of them. Yet, the exact opposite is true. Um, we're all very familiar with the heliocentric logic and the so-called proofs therein. Uh, we were all raised in the same educational system as you. It's not like we just, you know, climbed out from under some rock or fell off uh, some turnip truck from 400 years ago, right? Um, we've actually gone ahead and questioned the fundamental pillars or the fundamental premises involved with the everything starting, you know, again with the Big Bang going through to heliocentrism and the idea of inanimate soup <laughs> forming life out of sheer chance. Um, all of that is uh, theoretical folly that's taught as scientific fact when there is no evidence for any of it. It is mere theory. And um, when you find out that uh, entities like NASA are lying, taking our money to fool us, into believing in the preposterous and absurd uh, theoretical fantasies of theoretical physicists. And so this is a huge deception that uh, is right under your nose that you refuse to look at. Um, again, I don't ask you to be a flat earther. I just simply ask you to scrutinize the heliocentric model properly. Now, again, you believe that uh, you live stuck to the side of a spinning sphere in outer space in a vacuum, uh, flying around the sun at over 66,000 miles an hour, while the sun flies around the galaxy at uh, half a million miles an hour. Now, uh, you may not know this, but the Earth's uh, plane of orbit or the ecliptic is alleged to be offset to the path of the sun by 60 degrees so this uh, causes some or brings up some pretty you know 
serious questions about heliocentrism when you realize this and how gravity is supposedly an inward pulling uh, in all directions around a center of mass being the sun in this example while the earth somehow maintains a 60 degree plane of orbit around the sun as the sun travels around the galaxy um, this really doesn't make sense in a gravitic sense and in fact none of the heliocentric model makes any sense uh, the only reason that you deem it uh, possible that you live stuck to the side of this theoretical spinning sphere is due to the theory of gravity uh, first postulated and described by Newton and then uh, sort of cemented into the scientific record uh, by the you know the boy band of science uh, Einstein who again was nothing more than sort of a propped up and backed by certain interests uh, you know won't get into that but but certain interests backed uh, Einstein as sort of a superhuman super smart uh, genius uh, while in fact you know people that knew him claimed that he was not a genius he dropped out of high school beat his wife uh, was uh, and uh, you know even admitted towards the end of his life that most of his theories were probably wrong and will be disproved and again when you realize that the earth is a stationary plane gravity isn't necessary the the big bang theory goes right out the window and you do sort of if you want to stay true to the scientific method and uh call yourself a scientifically minded person then you really have to uh, revisit the heliocentric model as a rational adult as opposed to the last time you did it which was when you were a toddler uh, and any logical arguments you may have mustered against the globe earth like well why don't we fall off the side or what makes it spin or why do we have uh, perfect cycles if we're allegedly moving and spinning and our axis wobbles and how does the north pole star remain fixed above the axis if the axis is supposedly uh, traversing through space due to axial precession or uh, one degree every 72 years which is impossible uh, how is it possible that we can see any of the same stars or constellations from season to season in a heliocentric model uh, why don't we only see the uh, waning to no moon to uh, waxing crescent phases of the moon during the day exclusively in the day uh, why don't we only see full moons at night and exclusively at night um, you know th none of these basic observations are, are compatible with the heliocentric model I mean there's literally just this endless pile of evidence that proves the heliocentric model does not work a couple of them I just rapid fired through but you really have to research this and you really have to uh, reconsider some of these assumptions that we were reared uh, to believe as young as possible and um, frankly when you do revisit the spinning spherical earth in outer space governed by gravity you know the theory of gravity uh, is quite absurd and preposterous while the flat earth model while you know it still is in sort of its infancy um, you know we are also withheld a lot of information uh, I believe the key uh, a big key piece of information that we're missing is the entirety of Antarctica which is for all intents and purposes off limits to the uh, general public you can take guided tours to specific areas which are south of uh, the southern horn of Africa south of either New Zealand or, or Australia and south of South America those are the three main ways you get to Antarctica and they are all separate little areas where you cannot connect you know you, you cannot travel between the areas so you're cordoned off and other than that uh, you know, uh, Globers claim that it's impossible, you know, if, if you're looking at an azimuthal equidistant sort of projection, it would be impossible to govern that much area, when in fact they only have to govern those three key areas I just mentioned, those southernmost areas, because uh, it is a big world, and uh, you don't want to start, uh, well, you want to start as close as possible to your destination, and according to, like, the uh, original Mercator projections and older maps, uh, the southern tip of South America essentially butts right up to uh, at least some of the glaciers uh, of the Antarctic. So, you know, at any rate, the, the, the point to all of this is for you to claim that 
uh, flat earthers are denying evidence that's right in front of them is uh, preposterous because we have actually taken the time to study uh, both models. Uh, in most cases, I'm willing to bet you that an average flat earther knows more about the heliocentric model than an average glober, uh, plus uh, an average flat earther knows an infinite uh, infinitely more about the flat earth model than your average globe earther. So uh, this is one of those situations where if you continue to just fight this and ignore the evidence, then you're not adding anything to the conversation. And um, it, it, makes you, it makes a person wonder why you continue to participate in the conversation unless you're just deciding to argue for argument's sake. Last night, multiple times, Jaronism and his wife said that there's no proof of curvature on the earth. And I reminded them that I had just uploaded the latest video that shows with complete evidence that there is curvature of the earth. <laughs> it is documentable, it is observable, it is provable. <laughs> to say that there isn't curvature is to deny reality. I also brought up to Jaronism last night, and he said he'll make a video debunking this. Opposite poles, opposite hemispheres of the spherical Earth. The stars rotate in opposite directions. And this is very strong evidence that the Earth is a sphere because you cannot have stars rotating in opposite directions in opposite hemispheres on a flat Earth. Wow, is that really what you're going to start arguing is the apparent uh, opposite rotation of the stars in either hemisphere? Now, first of all, I would argue that if the uh, evidence for curvature is lacking, and in fact the, all the evidence shows the Earth to be a plane, and the evidence for axial rotation and orbital motion is lacking, as well as the entire concept of orbital mechanics being physically impossible, given the chaotic, gravitic nature of the model itself. Um, you know, with all that being said, what exactly does that have to do with the shape of the Earth? I mean, it's as if you know what the stars are and what the stars are doing. Uh, you're assuming that it's the Earth spinning that's causing the apparent motion of the stars when there is no evidence for this, and in fact there is evidence to the contrary, if you care to look. Uh, throughout history, uh, mainstream, well-funded scientists have been trying to prove that the Earth is spinning using a variety of experiments using uh, specifically light. Uh, one of the most famous is Ares failure. Uh, the reason they call, called it a failure is because uh, Ares wanted to prove that the earth was spinning and it was the starlight coming towards you know our eye or towards our telescope that was essentially coming in uh, more or less perfectly straight uh, stationary waves uh, but what in fact Aries experiments found was that it is the earth that is uh, stationary and it is the starlight or the ether or whatever medium is carrying the starlight that is spinning. Um, there are simple physical experiments you can do to prove that the earth isn't spinning. Oh, I see that one. I thought that was coming straight down. You know, a little over this way. Oh! <laughs> that was awesome. The fact that uh, you think that you have you know, some some sort of proof of a ball earth or exclusive proof uh, of a ball earth because of this apparent opposing rotation of the southern stars um, is, uh, it's circumstantial evidence 
Honestly, it, it truly is irrelevant. And knowing that the Earth is a stationary plane, there must be a rational. And uh, now, one thing that um, that I have theorized a lot. Um, well, a lot of this isn't theory. This is a theory based on fact. Um, so it's sort of educated guesses, which is really all we can do right now, um, short of physical experiments. But some things are sort of hard to do physical experiments with when you're talking about, say, an electromagnetic vortex that spans the entire flat Earth. Um, I'm not claiming that the uh, flat Earth is a disk in outer space. Uh, however, the known realm... Uh, that we, you know, dwell in that is uh, uh, ostensibly or allegedly uh, encompassed 360 degrees around by the what's known as the Antarctic. Um, uh, the the world itself generates a uh, an electromagnetic field, a magnetic vortex uh, coming from the center uh, and emanating south, you know, in all directions from the center. Uh, where the uh, central north is uh, sort of like the uh, positive pole of a disk magnet, while uh, all edges around the outside or the south are the uh, negative pole of such a disk magnet. Now, whatever's causing this magnetism, you know, that's a mystery, but... That's, it's not even argued by mainstream science that the Earth, whatever shape it is, omits a, uh, an electromagnetic field. So that's, that's not argued. Uh, the point being, however, uh, knowing what we know about cosmology that you are clueless about, no offense, you just haven't looked at this alternate cosmology that happens to... Uh, match reality better than the heliocentric infinite space cosmology um, but knowing what we know about this uh, new way of looking at the stars um, first of all uh, the heliocentric globe earth team has absolutely no clue what stars are even if they postulate uh, things like hot atomic fusion uh, and millions of light years away that's uh, pseudoscience, it's theoretical, it can never be proven in a million years, therefore it technically can't be 100% falsified, and so it is not science, it is pseudoscience. Um, all of that theory, uh, when, when you realize that there's an alternate model of the stars, uh, then you realize that light uh, definitely is playing tricks on our eyes. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, light is the or light is an uh, a specific uh, frequency uh, of wavelengths of electromagnetic waves, and so if you understand or when you understand that the Earth, uh, regardless of the shape, uh, but the Earth generates an electromagnetic field that uh, is a vortex and sort of looks like a uh, upside down bunt cake if you will um, the light waves these electromagnetic waves uh, coming from the sun and coming from the stars and coming from the moon are passing through these uh, natural uh, conduits for electromagnetic waves which are generated by the earth which you can call them uh, electromagnetic flux lines or magnetic flux lines and um, these are also uh, sort of matched by uh, the recently discovered um, ionized plasma tubes in the lower magnetosphere, so about 600 kilometers up, about three to 400 miles up or so, uh, you have these uh, meridian, uh, meridianally running uh, so north to south running plasma tubes in the lower magnetosphere that seem to jive with or uh, seem to be related to the natural electromagnetic field of the earth and so when you understand that the light coming from the stars which are absolutely not light year distant suns um, you know we have some theories as to what the stars are but that, that's sort of irrelevant um, the, whatever the source light of the stars and the sun is, 
uh, it's being uh, heavily uh, distorted and passed through uh, natural conduits generated by the earth that heavily affect our uh, little tiny uh, you know viewpoint of the stars Stars. Okay, so that was the first. That was the first tip of it. And um, so then, um, you can see the earth. You can see light reflected off of objects. Okay, as we look in this space, we we say this place is filled with light. We do not see any lines of light between us. Mm -hmm. We only see what is illuminated by the light, what the light reflects off of. We do not see the light itself. There, you see that laser beam? Right. No, you don't see the laser beam. You see the laser beam? Uh -huh. No, it's because it's off. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, right that, every time. That every time. <laughs> okay, you can see where the. Okay, between between you and me. No. No, it's not there. You cannot see light. Okay, it's really important to understand this. Sometimes you can see it. Oh, that's why you see the dust. You can you see the dust particles, right. right? You see only what light reflects off of. So when you actually look at a source in outer space, it is not transmitted, light is not transmitted in the visible spectrum in outer space. Period. So then how would it help a telescope? It, it will blind you, but you can't see it. So they do need those damn gl gl so basically gold can... reflectors. But you can look straight at the sun, not see anything, and get it is not visible. Oh, the word telescope has to have some kind of lens. Or like it needs a, a, diffra a diffraction lens. Okay. What what um, what really sealed the deal for Tom Brown uh, in his research is he found one of those um, you know coffee table you know like you know 18 by 24 you know uh, you know coffee table things you know that cost you know 500 bucks. It had 400 pages in it, 5,000 photographs of the sun. It was it was shown in every spectrum, you know, gamma rays and infrared, you know, X rays, you name. There were in that book, put out by NASA as like the definitive study of the sun. There was not one single photograph in the book of the sun in the visible spectrum. None. They were taken from outer space. Taken Not from, from taken from outer space. Right. No. What you see is the refraction of the sun in the upper atmosphere. That's all you see. That is not what it looks like. And the minute you get out of the atmosphere, you got no, no reflection between you and it. You can't see it. So if you took a, <clears throat> if you went in outer space and took a pinhole camera with just raw photographic film on the back, something that, that no that, lens in between to diffract with, you're not going to get an image of light. You may get an image in the, in the infrared or something else. There is no, okay. there's nothing in the visible spectrum. The visible spectrum effect of the sun is created by the upper atmosphere. Right. No, the Earth, the Earth reflecting off the atmosphere. No, the radiation from the sun. I mean, we're, we're, I mean, but the thing is, what you see is, you see an, a yellow orb in a blue background because the upper atmosphere actually diffracts right. the light into those two spectrums. Right. You don't just see orange against black. I mean, the Earth. You don't just see blues. Right. You know, you always see the yellow and blue. So. If I understand it correctly, if I took the pinhole camera and pointed it at the sun, I will get no image. But if I pointed it at the moon or the earth, I would get an image because yep. it's reflecting off the moon and the earth. You see the, the objects the that earth. the light reflects off. 
but the sun, I would get no image unless I was in a different spectrum. Because you spectrum. were pointing it right at the source of light. Okay. Because you can't, because light is not visible. Right. You cannot see the light. Okay. We, we have been lied to in a, such a wholesale manner about almost the nature of everything. Oh, yeah. That it's... So you can't see, you can't see the stars or anything? No, those are all... Sources. Created, those are all... The stars you see are created, the vision of them is created by the upper atmosphere. So the reason the, that the space shuttle, they have that window and they have atmosphere inside the shuttle, that's why when they look outside... They no, they, 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 they created diffraction the gratings in the window so you could see them. Because the early ones didn't. That was the other thing. Is Tom Brown called some of the old astronauts and asked them. They said no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you understand how electromagnetic vortices work, uh, for one thing, uh, the central part of this electromagnetic vortex, and this is proven science, this isn't theory, uh, the central part of the vortex, if it's spinning clockwise, then the exterior part of the vortex uh, is spinning in the opposite direction or counterclockwise, and vice versa. That's just how uh, electromagnetic or magnetic vortices operate. So you do have that, and, and that could be one uh, instance of why we see the phenomenon uh, of the southern stars. Um, again, an explanation for this is sort of irrelevant because nobody has a clue what the stars actually are or what's going on up there. A lot of further study uh, needs to be done on the stars and certainly not by NASA. Now, the other thing that you have to c consider is the atmosphere itself uh, behaves as sort of a subjective large convex lens around each and every one of us and so we all see the night sky slightly differently uh, depending on our location altitude atmospheric conditions etc etc and so the uh, our view towards the heavens our view towards the sun uh, is subjective and you're looking at a subjective instance or a, a single rendering of all of these different lights coming towards you, the observer. However, that's going to be a totally different experience for someone 200 miles west of you or south of you or whatever the case. And um, it, it is these uh, a few things, again, the electromagnetic field of the Earth as well as the uh, essentially... Uh, co large convex lens that follows you around wherever you go that heavily influence both of these factors heavily influence how light uh, travels through space and different layers of density atmosphere and electromagnetic fields and ionized plasma tubes to eventually reach your eye um, you know we you know, there's lots of room for all sorts of bizarre things that we're not aware of. And for you to say that counter-rotation of southern stars is exclusive to a sphere, then you're, you know, absolutely uh, experiencing confirmation bias. And you believe that every observation is exclusive to a sphere because you believe that no matter what, the Earth is a spinning sphere. I can show you proof, which I've actually shown several bits of proof throughout this video. The Earth is in a spinning sphere, yet no matter what, uh, you will continue believing that the Earth is indeed a spinning sphere. Now, another big part of this is the fact that um, when, you tr when you focus from anywhere in the northern hemisphere, even from the equator, when you focus on the North Pole Star Polaris, uh, you will see a perfect ring, you know, in, in terms of a time-lapse view, a perfect ring around Polaris. And Polaris remains essentially fixed in one single spot. 
Um, it does make a tiny little ring, but if you uh, focus your telescope on it, uh, you can leave your telescope right there and it'll stay fixed on Polaris. Now, um, this is a really key uh, debunking point of the heliocentric model for so many ways, uh, but we'll, we'll leave that alone for right now. Um, if you do, if you look at a time lapse, uh, long exposure, or a time lapse of, uh, you know, focusing on Polaris, you'll always see this tunnel pattern. Uh, however, uh, if you look at the Southern Cross area, or the, you know, the South Polar axis, not only is there not a South Pole star, but there is also no single point that uh, behaves as the North Star does in the South. There's no single point that you can point to in, in space that uh, remains central to all the other stars. For all those who think that the southern stars are a proof of uh, the globe, I want to show you something. And this can be found in most of the videos that I've seen about it. And also I've talked before about the fact that a lot of people are coming and saying you can't have Australia and South Africa and South America all looking in opposite directions, but all seeing the stationary Southern Pole star and the stars rotating around it. And then yep. the explanation when I looked into that and saw how really they're not all looking south, they're all looking in a different direction. So the next thing was, well, is that stationary, is that middle star stationary? So this is from the uh, very large telescope that's down in uh, South America somewhere. I don't. Whoops. What that's I that sounds so official. Very yeah. <laughs> large telescope. Yeah, really. <laughs> and one thing that you'll notice. So we're going to watch these stars here in a second, and I'll show you. And it's about right here. Okay. So when we look here at these um, southern stars, and I don't know how good this video feed is, but you will notice here that, and I'm going to keep rewinding this just to show you that these stars are not stationary okay so the the middle star sigma octanus or whatever um is going to be actually moving left to right there is no stationary point in the sky here they it slowly and i repeat slowly moves left to right so it, it's very slow it's very hard to see so you know for John Le Bon and people like that that um, are convinced that this southern star is a stationary point in the sky. Which it, it which it must be if the heliocentric model is correct. And since we do see Polaris behaving like that, then the south polar star must also be like that. As, as ridiculous as the north pole, you know, remaining fixed above the axis is, you know, we should see that on the south pole. Correct. And if we don't, then there's something else going on. Either those stars are moving across, you know, the outer edge or something else is happening. But if you notice here, and I'll try and put my mouse there, that where that spot is, is moving to the right ever so slowly. If you try and find the spot that you think it's rotating around and you leave your mouse there, it disappears. Even documented in Zetetic Astronomy um, way back in the 1860s that the South Polar stars behave differently than the North Pole star. So what this means is, is um, although you claim that, you know, flat earth doesn't have an explanation for the alleged identical south polar, uh, you know, axis of stars uh, similar to the one found in the north being Polaris, that's a myth. It's a wives tale and any uh, photographic evidence you can find of the so-called south polar uh, axis stars are forgeries um, and if you actually observe the far south observatories uh, you don't see the same pattern uh, that you do in the north uh, even viewed from the equator and even further south than the equator so what this means is you don't have this uh, bilateral symmetry that would be 100% necessary uh, in the heliocentric model in terms of the North Pole and the South Pole. And it's not just because of the lack of a, a central uh, South Polar axis in terms of uh, stars or a spot in space central to all the other stars. 
Um, there are tons of differences between the North Pole and the South Pole. They're not even remotely similar. Uh, the South Pole is a huge, vast, massive uh, permafrost, permanent glaciers uh, that are miles deep and hundreds of feet tall above the sea level. Um, there's no indigenous life that lives in the South Pole except for penguins. While in the North Pole, you ha it's essentially teeming with all sorts of life, polar bears, uh, you know, just all sorts of stuff. Uh, the far southern latitudes are far colder by record and on average. Uh, the water changes its uh, pH balance the further south you get. Uh, barometric pressure continues to decrease the further south you get. Um, so there's, you know, the, the Antarctic is, is really a big mystery. And, I mean, it's fairly obvious once you realize this that that is why they set up the Antarctic Treaty back in the, in the 1950s, uh, right after, uh, you know, U U.S. Admiral Richard Byrd uh, came back and reported that there was all sorts of great stuff that we could uh, live off of for centuries. Um, you know, you'd think that the governments of the world would, you know, use that as a resource, but instead they made it off limits to corporations and most people uh, cordoned it off because obviously they're hiding something and uh, it's, you know, Antarctica, uh, although it is sort of talked about in science fiction as, you know, alien bases and the end you know the entrance to the center of the earth and all this crazy stuff um all the this crazy wild conspiracy theory about antarctica now the nazis were very interested in it as well as the americans and the russian governments uh, were very interested in antarctica uh during and after world war one during the cold war during the space race and so what it appears to me is that the space race was a way to funnel money into uh, a program that was on the surface uh, space exploration, but in fact uh, most likely was uh, military domination and military manipulation of the Antarctic or the southernmost regions. And, um, you know, the little bases that we have you know, that are convenient to those three locations are, are just a small fraction of the actual Antarctic. Now, we will get into some of the perceived issues with the azimuthal equidistant projection that I know that you have because I have heard you mention, um, you know, you have issues with that projection, but uh, they are perceived problems um, because you obviously don't understand uh, what the azimuthal equidistant projection represents and, and how it works. Um, it's got similar problems to the Mercator projection. Um, and it's also got similar problems to the globe. Um, but we'll get into all that in just a little bit. I just really wanted to point out that uh, the lights that you can see in the night sky are in no way whatsoever proof of either axial rotation or earth curvature and in fact the lights in the night sky have proven throughout history uh, documented scientific history by mainstream you know educated scientists including airy and his famous uh, Aries failure and then you've got the michelson morley michelson gale and sanyak experiments uh, proving conclusively that the earth is stationary Oh, I see that one. I thought that was going straight down. You know, a little over this way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do basic f physical experiments to prove the Earth is stationary. And so whatever the stars are doing in the northern, northern and southern hemispheres um, 
could have there could be lots of explanations i mean the atmosphere itself uh, or the atmosphere plane behaves as a giant lens and you've got this electromagnetic vortex which uh, you know electromagnetic fields can bend and distort and uh, change light waves in all sorts of ways that you're probably not aware of and many people and including myself probably don't fully understand but you know just to to assume that because you can see southern rotation of stars in the southern axis which is absolutely nothing like what you see in the north by the way um is not proof of anything other than um you know we need to study the stars further but it still doesn't prove curvature or axial rotation um especially considering you cannot find a central point in the south similar to that of polaris and I don't mean even a star. It, there should be a point. If there's not a star there, there should be a single point that you can focus on that remains fixed above that south polar axis. And uh, that should be visible anywhere south of the equator, just as it is in the north. And um, you, you can't find such things. So, you know you have nothing there i mean it's it's um it's a non-argument there's there's nothing to argue there i'm gonna roll a quick clip that uh jaren exerted from their debate that they had uh monday the 23rd uh, because it really, you know, just this one, it's a short clip, uh, encapsulates the, just the utter ignorance of your typical globe earther, where it's so frustrating from this side of the argument because you literally have to teach your opponent in this debate about their own model. You have to coach them on attacking your model properly you have to coach them on defending their own model properly. And so it isn't even a debate. It's more like trying to teach an unruly, uh, bratty child uh, simple arithmetic while they plug their ears and close their eyes and scream la 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 la. I mean, that's really about the size of a, a typical flat earth, globe earth debate. And so let's roll this quick clip from uh, Jaredism's uh, excerpt from it. And I may butt in this a little bit because, I mean, this really, uh, this sort of uh, behavior from Globe Earthers and just uh, pulling bullshit out of the thin air and, and claiming it to be scientific fact is just so typical. And yet, because we're crazy flat earthers, then anything that you think you can come up with that defends the globe model must be true. I mean, I don't know where uh, people like this get off, but we'll, let's just roll the clip. The North Star proves the Earth is a sphere. <laughs> that is the single most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. The North Star proves the Earth is a sphere. What the hell are you talking about? Now, I know that you go on to claim some more ridiculous things, but let's just think about this for a minute. Um, and you even admit later on here in a minute that uh, the North Star has been above the North Polar Axis for all of recorded history, hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of years. Now, what you don't seem to understand is that single fact disproves the heliocentric model and it certainly doesn't prove curvature of the earth so you're just way the hell out in left field here but what my point is is when you look at the phenomenon of uh the so-called precession of the equinoxes which is alleged allegedly caused by the axial precession of the earth uh over time over 26,000 years um, you'll realize that if you consider the polar, the North Polar Axis as a pointer pointing at the very distant uh, North Pole star Polaris, it is very distant, although it is not the most distant star, uh, but it is very distant, uh, that pointer, that alignment, uh, imagine, you know, if you've ever used a sniper rifle zeroing in on a target that's a mile away. 
if you don't have your alignments perfect, uh, you're not going to be able to zero in on it. You have to be aligned perfectly. If you were to misalign from that target from a mile away uh, by even a fraction of a degree, uh, you're going to be way off. Now, uh, when you think of Polaris as being pointed at by our north polar axis, and the fact that the north polar axis is allegedly going through this 26,000 year wobble, which is allegedly causal of the precession of the equinoxes, uh, then you would know that the axis, the north polar axis, as well as the south polar axis, uh, but uh, we're just talking about the north because it points directly at Polaris, which is a unique uh, phenomenon in all of the uh, Earth. Uh, but however, that uh, pointer, that axis, should be... Uh, going through this uh, wobble, this procession, at one degree every 72 years. So what that means is that we should see throughout history a series of new north stars. And as a matter of fact, the more distant you place the star, the worse the problem becomes. Because again, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you realize this, but uh, even a small divergence in angle, if you extend that, uh, if you extend that divergent line from a baseline, say it's a half a degree over a mile or a million miles, then you've got a huge massive divergence. It's the same concept with a sniper rifle. Um, if, you, if you've got a mile distant target and you're misaligned by a fraction of a degree, you're gonna miss that target by a mile, so to speak, you know, not literally. Uh, but the same thing goes for the very distant North Pole star Polaris. Uh, the fact that it has remained above the uh, so-called North Polar axis for all of recorded history uh, debunks the heliocentric model because the so-called precession of the equinoxes is dependent on that axis wobbling uh, over 26,000 years. And although that may seem like a long time, uh, astronomers uh, meticulously studying the heavens for a few thousand years would have certainly noticed uh, the North uh, Pole Star changing many, many, many times throughout history. And we'd notice it even in, uh, you know, maybe a couple of lifetimes. Because if that thing moves two degrees over 140 years, then, uh, yeah, you, you know, technically we should have a new North Star every 50 to 100 years at the most. And the fact that the North Pole Star Polaris has remained fixed just as it does, just as it always does, throughout recorded history, uh, completely disagrees with and demolishes the heliocentric model. And the, the fact that you claim so boldly and just ignorantly that the North Pole Star proves the Earth is a globe is like saying, you know, bananas prove the Earth is a banana, or the North Pole Star Polaris proves that uh, leprechauns bury their treasures at the end of rainbows. I mean, there is no chain of logic to your claim. Uh, you, you seem to think that all observations are exclusive to a sphere, even when the observations can couldn't possibly occur on a sphere with the given proportions and behaviors as the Earth. One huge example would be what goes up must come down. What is gravity? You have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> It's called gravity. <laughs> ah. I gotta say, you're totally blowing my mind right now. That's what I do. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, bitch. Uh, globe earthers for some reason seem to think that the fact that what goes up must come down somehow proves that they live stuck to the side of a spinning sphere uh, when in fact what goes up must come down is 100 percent compatible with the flat stationary earth you, you know this is the level of 
just complete bias and incapability of the masses to uh, think outside of the box to the point to where you take an observation such as what goes up must come down which is a physical impossibility if you are somehow stuck to the side of a spinning sphere yet there is all of this wild theory uh, ultimately coming from Einstein who replaced Newton uh, who merely described gravity mathematically. Einstein came up with a theory to explain gravity, but he doesn't really explain it. He just comes up with big, long equations and explanations that were actually thought of uh, by others prior to him. He merely took credit for uh, many of his ideas in terms of general relativity and certain equations that he's famous for. Um, but for some reason, people point to Einstein's theories as laws of physics which is uh, totally ridiculous however that's what we're stuck with an observation that is incompatible with a spinning sphere what goes up must come down is patched over by theory that makes absolutely no sense uh, the theory essentially goes the mass of the spherical earth uh, warps the natural rectilinear state of space-time uh, which is a well, a vacuum, it is nothing. So the mass of the Earth warps nothing, space-time, and space and time, a vacuum, somehow sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's bad language to say the word push, but it is essentially an acceleration of objects and uh, mass towards the center of the Earth, towards the center of gravity. Um, which again if you think about this it's it's just preposterous uh, how can a vacuum push against anything with any force let alone enough force to hold the oceans at the equator which are allegedly spinning uh, over a thousand miles an hour you're talking about uh, millions and billions and tons of water uh, being stuck to the side of this spinning sphere at the equator and yet a dragonfly can hover right there and gravity is uh, so weak it doesn't affect it is as you believe gravity causes what goes up to come down you believe this is exclusive proof of a spinning sphere and I'm here to tell you that you are 100% wrong in your premise um, the only reason you would technically theoretically even need gravity is if you do live stuck to the side of a spinning sphere so uh, if you take away that assumption and, and realize that the Earth is indeed a static plane without orbital motion, without axial rotation, without the necessary inverse uh, square curvature to result in an overall sphere, then uh, gravity is not necessary. And again, the simple laws of density and buoyancy allow for what goes up must come down. And again, the static electric charge of the Earth allows for the nudge for denser or higher density objects to tend downward and it is that simple and you know mind you the grandfather of uh, theoretical physics or the grandfather of gravity Isaac Newton uh, would have had zero understanding of electromagnetism and so uh, neither would he have had any understanding of man flight uh, neither would he have had understanding of uh, video, high altitude weather balloons, instant communication, uh, computer assistance for long algorithms and mathematical problems that might take a genius like Newton a month to complete. A uh, computer can do it in, in an instant. So, you know, we, we th this day and age, are far better equipped to... Um, prove things one way or another than uh, Newton certainly or even Einstein was equipped and you know people really do worship Einstein as if he's some sort of God on earth um, and and they often credit him with the uh, sort of indirectly credit him with the invention of the, the nuclear bomb uh, using the equation E equals MC squared however again since uh, atoms are theoretical and 
almost certainly do not exist in reality as they claim, then splitting atoms is a theoretical fantasy, and even if such a thing were possible, um, they never did achieve it. I, I don't even think they really tried. I think that the whole, whatever it's called, Manhattan Project, I always want to say the Philadelphia Experiment, I get the two confused, but the, right, the Manhattan Project, where it was this secretive thing where nobody told anyone that they were building nu nuclear bombs, um, because what they were actually doing was is uh, pretending to R&D or research and, and develop nuclear bombs, but they were just merely propagandizing people to believe that they had nuclear bombs by detonating uh, tons and thousands of tons of TNT or heavier explosives and showcasing that to uh, convince the American citizens and possibly the Russians, although I do think that there was some collaboration with the Russians, in fact, but to, to convince the people at large that they had these nuclear bombs that could decimate entire cities, and now their claims have gotten even more grandiose with, you know, 100 megaton or 1,000 megaton, you know, 1,000 million tons of dynamite TNT. Um, that's what they claim they have now. Uh, but in fact, all of this is theoretical folly, just as a hot atomic fusion or what you think stars are made of is theoretical folly, just as gravity is theoretical folly, just as space-time itself is theoretical folly, just as the spinning sphere Earth is theoretical folly, just as the Big Bang Theory is theoretical folly. All of your infinite space um, mainstream propagated, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek upbringing um, has led you down a path of complete and utter deception, and you will ridicule and uh, get extremely angry with people who are really trying to do you a huge favor and get you to look at evidence. Again, I don't, I don't try to turn anyone into a flat earther. Now, I will argue points with you because, I, you know, I love being on the right side of an argument. Um, but my goal is is merely to get you to honestly, objectively look at the heliocentric model, find the obvious glaring problems with it rationally scrutinize and compare apples to apples the data in both models and then decide which seems more plausible and i guarantee that if you do this honestly diligently it might take some time um, but this is nothing to be embarrassed of this is the scientific method and and i can guarantee you that you will uh, at the end of however long it takes you whether it's a week or a month or a year to go through your entire checklist of globe earth proofs whether it's the Coriolis effect whether it's uh, the ships over the horizon or the opposing rotation of the southern stars whatever you know your hang-up is on the globe um, the simple fact of the matter is the, the earth is easily proven to be a stationary plane so all of that other stuff has explanations for it uh, the Corio Coriolis effect included. Um, that's been uh, explained perfectly in the flat earth model and there's no need for a rotating uh, spherical earth. So we'll get back into it but uh, I did just want to show you and maybe I won't try to find another diagram but I promise you it was couldn't have been more than a month ago that uh, gravity, uh, the strength of gravity was 10 to the zero. But again, you know, once you get to zero what difference does it make if you have less than zero? Ah, I'll tell you, these uh, theoretical physicists sure, sure do have their uh, craniums lodged into their rectums at times, it would seem. Now, gravity is so weak, it doesn't affect the dragonfly, yet it is so strong and selective that it allows for our upper atmosphere to 
exist adjacent to this so-called vacuum of outer space or space-time which is preposterous uh, anyone that knows uh, the first thing about fluid dynamics understands that uh, a vacuum simply cannot exist adjacent to a gaseous atmosphere and what evidence do you have to support this uh, really bizarre theory that uh, the atmosphere exists adjacent to an infinite vacuum well yet again you point to einstein's theory of gravity uh, and so what proof is there of gravity well there is no proof of gravity it's all theoretical um, Planck and Bicep got in trouble a year or two ago for uh, saying that they found proof of gravity waves uh, when in fact it was just background uh, radiation, cosmic noise. And more recently, LIGO uh, claims to have found proof of gravity waves, but um, I just uploaded a video on that. Uh, what they found was a signal. The signal was a blip on a chart where quote, as time went forward, the frequency went up, end quote. And the scientists at LIGO convinced themselves this was evidence of a 1.3 billion year old gravity wave. And what they gave you was uh, not one, but two real computer simulations, uh, which is a definite oxymoron. You know, either something's real or something's a simulation. LIGO. A group of uh, scientists in LIGO is uh, some sort of uh, inferometer device. It's the, quote, most precise measuring device ever built. Uh, but this group of scientists running LIGO, who just so happen to be very thirsty for grant money, uh, they've convinced themselves, due to a blip on a chart, that they have found proof of gravity waves, as well as black holes, as well as binary black holes, as well as binary black holes merging into a single singularity, uh, double positive, bah, single singularity, but whatever. Um, but all of these, you know, very, very exciting and astounding discoveries by LIGO uh, because they interpreted a blip on a chart. We have detected gravitational waves. We. <laughs> They were detected by LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. LIGO is the most precise measuring device ever built. <laughs> Let me start with what we saw. So on September 14th, 2015, Anna recorded a signal, and the signal had a very specific characteristic. The characteristic of as time went forward, the frequency went up. And now it took us months of careful checking, rechecking, analysis, looking at every piece of data to make sure that what we saw was not something that wasn't a gravitational wave, but in fact it was a gravitational wave. And we've convinced ourselves, we've convinced ourselves, convinced ourselves, convinced ourselves. That's the case, and we're here to announce that, that today. <laughs> By the way, this is not a Hollywood production that I'm going to show you. It is actually a real computer simulation. 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 Talk about the gravitational waves. You didn't see any gravitational waves there. What you saw was actual black holes. Now let me look at this from the, uh, the gravitational wave perspective. So you're going to be again a computer simulation. This is a real simulation. So you're going to be again a computer simulation. This is a real simulation. 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 Let me start with what we saw. So on September 14th, 2015, the two LIGO observatories in Hanford, Washington, and Livingston, Louisiana, recorded a signal nearly at the same time, nearly simultaneously, and the signal had a very specific characteristic, a characteristic 
of as time went forward, the frequency went <laughs> And they made a very convincing CGI rendering of what the gullible scientists at LIGO concocted to lend credence to their very ambitious and flimsy evidence of so-called gravity waves no less than 1.3 billion years ago, ergo 1.3 billion light years away, and yet we can't detect any sort of gravity waves emanating from the galactic center, or the sun, or the moon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, something uh, categorically cannot be real and a simulation. Uh, the two terms are mutually exclusive and opposite. So uh, the scientists at LIGO uh, used a definite oxymoron as a uh, demonstration of their theory or interpretation of a blip on a chart that was again, quote, uh, described as, uh, as time went forward, the frequency went up. End quote. So, um, with all that being said, uh, gravity is also, well, it's weak and strong at the same time and selective in terms of it can hold a single molecule of very light and disparate gas adjacent to the Kármán line or adjacent to the edge of space, uh, yet gravity is also so strong that it can connect the uh, moon to the earth and the sun to the earth and the sun to the galactic center and the galactic center to the great attractor allegedly and uh, what this means to me is the, the claim that uh, the speed of light waves as the fastest speed in the universe is ridiculous because um, the orbit of the sun around the alleged galactic center, for example, is connected to the uh, what is alleged to be a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. This is all heliocentric, preposterous theory, but the sun is connected to the center of the galaxy uh, many, many, many millions of miles away by gravity. And gravity, although there is really truly no evidence for it, is somehow uh, propagating and, and tethering the sun to the galactic center, propagating through a vacuum, nothing, uh, instantaneously over those many, many, many millions of, uh, I guess you could say, light years or thousands of light years to the galactic center, however far it is, uh, gravity is uh, acting instantaneously. Uh, and so that is much faster than, than light speed. Now, the fact that the LIGO scientists are claiming that the 1.3 billion year old light coming from those two black holes that they mentioned uh, that the gravity waves reached us at the speed of light really doesn't make any sense because, uh, again, in order for the heliocentric model to work, then gravity waves must uh, perpetuate through space-time instantaneously over great distances. Um, there, there must be no lag, actually, in the time it takes gravity to reach any distant body that has a gravitic relationship, in fact. So this is a big flaw in the whole heliocentric theory, honestly. But, you know, the main point of this is that uh, I, it really just perplexes me how Globe Earth proponents can completely overlook evidence and just completely uh, maintain a mindset of willful ignorance uh refusal to refusal to consider alternative hypothesis just for argument's sake in spite of the mountains of evidence out there um, there is some disinformation out there so you may be one of those people that got caught in the trap of the likes of the flat earth society which um, is intended to 
uh, sort of funnel in the people who are, you know, cursory researchers that will stumble upon the Flat Earth Society and find much uh, preposterous argument and red herring argument mixed with, you know, some grains of truth, but ultimately it's misinformation about the Flat Earth truth. Uh, in order to steer people away from the truth because again uh, this deception uh, is the cornerstone of all deceptions in the world I mean this is the big one uh, anyway we'll continue on You see, a lot of flat earthers like seem to have no knowledge about the North Star. They don't understand that it's way, way further away than all the other stars. That's why it appears to never move in the sky because it's so distant. Don't fuck of the year, Lord. Don't fuck of the year, Lord. You have just won the dumb fuck of the year award. You said. That's why it appears to never move in the sky, because it's so distant. And that makes you a dumbass, because the further away you place the North Pole Star Polaris, the worse it makes the problem of the axis allegedly pointing directly towards it for all of history. Now, supposedly you have a 26,000 year phase called the precession of the equinoxes. Now, the precession of the equinoxes is supposedly caused by this axis of ours, this theoretical axis, uh, moving through uh, space, precessing, sort of like a top, you know, precessing through space uh, one degree every 72 years. Now, what this means is that we should see a constantly changing North Star, never having the same North Star for longer than 50 to 100 years. 200 at the most, and yet we've had Polaris for all of recorded history. Wow. Now, you know, again, the Earth supposedly spins, but on that axis that it spins, it supposedly wobbles uh, around once every 26,000 years, which equates to one degree over 72 years, which means we should never have a fixed North Star for more than a couple centuries at the very most. So, wow, the level of ignorance on this one is just astonishing. That's no, dude, you're so off. I hope you know how bad you're, you're completely wrong about that. What do you how? mean? It's, how am I completely wrong about that? Because That's mathematics. What do you mean it's mathematics? The, the, it, so the other stars that do circles in the skies has something to do with their distance from the Earth? Absolutely. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, Dude, I don't oh. understand why that's funny. The North Star is supposed to be way further away than all those other stars. The star is between 400 and 500 um, light years away. That it's not, it's not far at all compared to every other star. The stars are all such equal distances away from the Earth. Not equal. I'm saying they are all so incredibly far that they all act ex identical. That's why we see star circles, because even though one might be 100 light years and the other one might, might be 4,000 light years, even though that's a couple hundred trillion miles difference, they do the exact same thing. The reason the North Star stays where it is is because it's directly aligned with the axis of the Earth. That's the reason why it stays where it is. It has nothing to do with its distance. It's not even- According to the model, anyway. But... Yeah, according to the model. I, and this is why I hate explaining the globe. Look, I, I, so I just have to say something. Mm. Yes, yes, thank you, Missa. I totally do the same thing uh, and forget to remind the silly globbers that uh, I'm trying to explain uh, that they are misrepresenting their own model. So I was totally following what Jaren was saying, and, and I really get uh, stuck on that slippery slope a lot in terms of uh, conversation with globeheads because... Uh, we always find ourselves in a position where we're having to explain the Globber's own model to them uh, properly and expra explain their own arguments to them properly so that they might attempt to adequately attack our arguments or at least adequately defend their own model with, you know, accepted science. And in most cases, uh, even self-proclaimed you know, scientific geniuses and whatnot 
um, don't understand the absurd allegations involved with the very heliocentric model that they claim to uh, represent and cling to so tenaciously. Um, so it's literally up to us as the flat earth proponents to counsel and to teach and really to kibitz our own opponents, you know, uh, give our opponents tips and, and sort of help them out in attacking us so that at least we might have a fair debate that uh, both sides of the argument are represented accurately, uh, which is ironic and sort of comical, I'm sorry. Um, but it is often up to, and in most cases, up to the flat earther to teach the globe clinger about their very model uh, that they are clinging to, uh, you know, very viciously and tenaciously. So I think a lot of this has to do with our culture, which has allowed for anonymous cowards to carry out uh, sort of narcissistic fantasies uh, by inventing arguments which make no sense whatsoever and are not aligned to anybody's theory, including the you know pro heliocentric people's theory uh, just absolute nonsense they make up off the top of their head because they think it makes sense or maybe they think they heard it somewhere or they just I don't know I don't know where people come up with certain things like that uh, in terms of the, the distance of Polaris yet for some reason this sort of person feels that if they simply ignore what you're telling them or ignore the truth um, which does happen to be the case here with Hubbard's claim regarding the distance to Polaris, then honestly there is no sense in trying to debate such a person. Now honestly, we flat earthers will uh, really go out of our way and meet people halfway and really try to help people understand uh, the truth. And you know, I, I think um, it's pretty, you know, pretty misrepresent. Uh, it's a pretty wild misrepresentation a lot of people make, uh, category categorizing flat earthers as sort of vicious attackers. Um, we may seem stubborn at times. That's because you know we've educated ourselves on this very heavily. Uh, however, y you know there are some out there and. They may be agent provocateurs who are just instigators, but honestly, most of the instigating I've ever seen is uh, coming from the Globe Earth side, because uh, Globe Earthers never argue uh, for curvature or axial rotation or proofs of a spinning sphere Earth. They always argue first against the uh, moral integrity of the flat Earth proponent, then the uh, psychological integrity of the flat earth proponent and then you know they avoid the actual arguments and debates by applying simple ignorance and uh, unfortunately um, this is the uh, singular tactic uh, at some point you know we flat earth proponents trying to help people will eventually refuse to cotton to people who refuse to listen and refuse to consider the obvious truth just for argument's sake you know just for shits and giggles and um what they use is this singular tactic to protect their paradigm to protect their worldview it is a self-defense mechanism and again that secret weapon that singular tactic that is used uh, ultimately by all of the tenacious vicious globe earth clingers is plain old ignorance willful unadulterated uninhibited remorseless uh, ignorance which is celebrated in our culture. If you've never seen the uh, film Idiocracy, don't. But that's essentially where we're at. And this, uh, this sort of celebration of ignorance allows for the herd mentality of unimaginably deceived people to attack the very ones trying to help them and trying to show them the truth and trying to unveil this really ultimate deception um, that's been going on for quite a long time um, trying to help people realize this ultimate truth uh, and, and really what this truth boils down to at the at the most fundamental and, and really profound level is that we collectively are not some 
cosmic accident which sprang up from a big bang and a pile of inanimate soup which randomly wrote billions of lines of DNA code, uh, complex DNA code, successfully in order to create a uh, self-replicating uh, life form that would eventually evolve, in quotes, into a sentient being. Um, the, the notion, you know, the science, the, the mainstream scientific notion that amino acids randomly arrange themselves into specific complex essentially terabytes and terabytes of code, uh, allowing for essentially biological nanotechnology to build sentient life forms from simple materials and our ability to, to question our existence and realize the difference between right and wrong, truth and lies, uh, the ability to paint you know, a beautiful portrait or just write a song or whatever i mean you know uh, there are all these uh aspects of consciousness that we take for granted but you know where does that come from does that come from dna code or does that come from when us within us or is it merely electrical impulses interpreted by the brain or is there something more to it you know, and when you do look at things like DNA code and how complex they are, um, it is self-evidence of a creator. Uh, you simply cannot have billions of lines of complex code that is uh, put together in such a perfect way that uh, you can uh, create self-replicating sentient beings out of simple materials uh, with all of the necessary software uh, to create biological hardware out of simple materials so again this is uh impossible due to chance and um when you come to terms with the fact that the in the the universe is not some infinitude of galaxies and stars due to this uh theoretical big bang 14 billion years ago then uh the idea of evolution uh, really goes out the window and um the fact that there are no transitional fossil records in terms of species jumping from uh, one species to another uh, has never been found. And even Darwin himself admitted that uh, within 50 years, if uh, even Darwin admitted, admitted himself that, you know, within 10 or 20 or 50 years or eventually, if uh, biologists and geologists didn't find uh, at least one just by happenstance or probably many uh, sort of intermediary fossils uh, you know proof of evolution it's never been found and so even according to the uh, original theorizer of evolution Charles Darwin then you know the theory has sort of been debunked by de uh, debunked by default uh, because the fossil record evidence is not there to support the hypothesis um, and there are other problems with evolution as well we won't get into all that but the the truth is our postmodern culture has gotten to the point where reality is being uh, blurred with fantasy and science fiction is being merged with reality and not just in simulations but uh, literally you know on the horizon are going to be biological implants biological upgrades or possibly um, genetic upgrades um, you know there are people that are pushing for this sort of thing and it's been in the uh, the writing's been on the wall for this sort of thing a long time in uh, media uh, movies and video games you know it's been uh, the Terminator I mean think about them all Cherry 5000 goes back pretty far um, and now you know the technology's there uh, science fiction is being merged or has been merged with uh, science fact and so uh, well in other words what we believe to be scientific fact in terms of theoretical physics is nothing more than science fiction and uh, what people believe to be some weird conspiracy theory in terms of the flat stationary earth that we live on um, this this is the deception um, it is intended to belittle our place in the universe and it's done a great job honestly 
And uh, in terms of this whole transhumanist movement, I wouldn't be surprised if we see people with their, uh, you know, with robot bodies walking around with their heads attached uh, via USB 20.10, you know, cords. Uh, who knows? Uh, anyway, if the globber, you know, doesn't even understand, you know, the globber that you're arguing with doesn't even understand the full spectrum of their very own model that they, you know, purport. Uh, for example, the alleged supersonic axial rotation anywhere near the tropics. Um, a lot of globbers, if you tell them, so, you know, you believe that the uh, equator is spinning over a thousand miles an hour, they'll call you a liar or they'll say that that's not true when in fact according to the heliocentric model that's the truth um, another one would be the fact that uh, during uh, many total lunar eclipses the Sun and the moon have been seen above the horizon in the same sky at the same time during total lunar eclipses uh, which is geometrically impossible to occur in the heliocentric model and yet it's explained away by um, re really just bizarre theoretical nonsense that does not account for the fact that uh, many times throughout history it's been documented uh, total lunar eclipses where both the sun and the moon were visible above the horizon in the same sky so there you have that um, but if you tell people about that, Globeheads, they will say that you're a liar. Uh, but if you, you actually go and look it up, there's a term for it in the scientific record, and it's happened, you know, some 58 times in uh, recorded eclipse history, so it's not uh, that uncommon. Um, usually there's about 128 to 130 uh, total solar as well as total uh, lunar eclipses every year. Now, Another thing, you know, you can, when you tell people, you know, this about this alleged supersonic axial rotation anywhere near the tropics and especially at the equator, um, or show them how the phases of the moon work, because a lot of uh, globe earthers uh, think that the phases of the moon are caused by the Earth's shadow. Um, honestly, a lot of globe earthers believe that when. You know, obviously the heliocentric model purports that it is the, uh, you know, it's just the cycle of the moon, the moon orbiting the Earth and the uh, light reflecting back to us at uh, relatively different angles throughout that cycle. Now, you do get some pretty weird things with the moon. Um, it allegedly takes 27.3 uh, days to orbit the Earth. Um, that's what you... Uh, always hear however it takes about 29 days to uh, make a full lunar cycle so from new moon to new moon uh, so that's a little odd but they say that's because the earth is moving however um, it could be for a number of things we won't get into that that's not the the main topic of this year uh, anyway you know, you look at another example would be unfounded beliefs about the distances to the stars, and this example would apply to you, Mr. Hubbard, um, even according to the mainstream liaretical li lobotomists. <laughs> uh, the nearest visible star is about 4.22 light years away. Polaris is about 450 light years away and the most distant visible star now all these numbers are according to the heliocentric model and according to ground-based observation uh, the the most distant visible sp uh, star from the ground is about 16,308 light years so again the nearest visible star is 4.22 light years allegedly Polaris is 450 light years allegedly and the most distant visible star from the ground is about 16,308 light years, allegedly. So keep those numbers in mind. Uh, what I find so funny about this is the fact that the light we're supposedly seeing from the uh, most distant visible star is very old data uh, compared to the uh, star that's only four light years away, meaning we're just now seeing where the uh, star allegedly was 16,308 years ago uh, on the high end of visible stars from the ground. So we honestly have not a freaking clue where that star is today, 
according to the heliocentric model. And in fact, that star could have theoretically traveled a million miles in some other direction by now, and we won't know it for another 16,000 years. Uh, or that star could have literally exploded 10,000 years ago, and we won't even know it for another 6,000 years, according to the preposterous, absurd heliocentric model. Now, um, all of this hyperbole and conjecture extraordinaire is found all throughout the heliocentric model. There are no boundaries to the human imagination, and because the stars are so mysterious and uh, NASA has been deceiving people uh, most recently, um, you know, we've just gotten theoretical sciences have gotten so far off the beaten path in terms of uh, truth and the scientific method and the pursuit of truth that um, it's just ridiculous. But um, you really can't use those numbers uh, in terms of the distance of the stars because of what I just mentioned. Because it's uh, one of the, the most distant star is 16,000 year old data. Uh, the nearest star is uh, four year old data the sun is eight minute year old data all according to the heliocentric model um, so we honestly have no idea you know where any of the stars are especially the more distance of, of the stars um, but the point is you really can't use these numbers to average the distance between those three stars uh, but under no circumstances is Polaris so far away that it never moves according to you um, the heliocentric model explains that Polaris remains fixed above the polar axis due to a dead-on balls alignment. However, I've already explained that that is impossible to occur for any length of time for any one star or for any one spot in space. Um, for one reason, due to the alleged necessary precession uh, one degree every 72 years, which would be extremely noticeable over sh relatively short periods of time throughout history. You'd have a whole series of North Stars uh, documented throughout history. If you're talking about one degree of precession every 72 years, um, but also uh, not even these long-term cycles are necessary to disprove uh, the spinning sphere model, you know, at a tilt going around the sun, going around the galaxy. Um, another way that you can disprove this is the simple act of uh, facing opposite directions in space from dusk until dawn. Um, as well as facing opposite directions in space from winter to summer. Um, this has nothing to do with stellar parallax, but this is the simple result of facing in an opposite direction towards space um, as we're supposedly on a spinning orbiting sphere. Um, so, you know, we're talking about misalignments that should be occurring and don't occur because the world is stationary and the stars are not what you think they are. They're not everything is not what you've been led to believe in terms of the earth and the cosmos the, and the universe, the big bang. I mean all of that is uh, it's nonsense people I'm sorry to tell you. Now we will go ahead just for fun we'll, we'll go ahead and based on these numbers we'll take the average distance between the three stars mentioned again the uh, nearest visible star from the ground the furthest visible star from the ground and Polaris uh, using the heliocentric values the average of those three is about 5587.4 light years away. Now, of course, these numbers are theoretical hogwash dreamed up by intellectually stunted theoretical physicists uh, craving after fortune and glory and recognition throughout the globe Earth history. But using these very numbers, uh, Polaris being allegedly 450 light years away, according to you, then Polaris is only about 8% of the distance of the average of those three stars. And in terms of the furthest visible star, which you claimed Polaris was the furthest visible star, you claimed it was so far, that's why it never moves. Uh, Polaris is uh, allegedly 2.7% of the distance to the 
most distant visible star. Okay, 2.7%. So f what this means is your explanation for Polaris remaining fixed above the axis because of its distance is just ridiculous. Now, in order for uh, this to work in your model, in order for Polaris to remain fixed above the axis of our measly, wobbly, arbitrary, pointing North Pole axis, Polaris must be traveling many light years in all sorts of directions throughout the year and throughout the eon and throughout the evening, actually, in order to remain fixed above our measly, arbitrary, wobbly North Pole axis of rotation, according to your model. Um, this is important possible for Polaris to remain fixed above the axis of rotation for any duration um, in and of itself to have Polaris remain over the axis from one season to the next uh, also uh, debunks the heliocentric model due to the angles involved nothing to do with stellar parallax uh, but it has to do with facing in opposite directions in space from winter to summer um, you probably know this, but I'll just go ahead and say it anyway. Uh, the Sun allegedly orbits around the galactic, the Milky Way galaxy, along a single plane, which is more or less adherent to the uh, galactic plane. Now, the galaxy is allegedly traveling at some millions of miles an hour like this, but we won't even consider the uh, frame of reference of the galaxy. We'll just say, here's the plane of orbit of the Sun. It's, you know, it goes around in a 150 to 250 million year cycle, allegedly, but the path of the Sun is more or less aligned to the galactic equator. Now, the ecliptic, or the uh, plane which the Earth allegedly uh, orbits the Sun around, is uh, offset to the uh, path of the Sun by 60 degrees, right? So, um, what you have is just this uh, really bizarre situation where during one season, uh, visible space would be northwest of the galactic equator, say, during the summer, and six months later, visible space would be southeast of the galactic equator, say, that's winter. And again, it's nothing to do with stellar parallax, the further you place the stars, the worse this problem becomes, because we're talking about facing in one direction uh, towards visible space, uh, and then six months later facing a total another direction towards visible space. Um, this, this applies uh, especially to equatorial stars, but it even applies to stars that you can look at in the northern hemisphere even over the course of an evening. Um, but the point is, is the fact that uh, all of the stars remain stationary relative to one another. The constellations have never changed. Um, we see repeating cycles, perfect repeating cycles that are just not uh, conducive to a random chaotic heliocentric model. Uh, you know, uh, bodies some in motion somehow maintaining perfect uh, planes of orbit around other bodies in motion, uh, moving in contrary directions at the same time, and calling that a fixed linear frame of reference is just the most ridiculous thing in the world. Um, you calling Polaris the most uh, distant star is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. And uh, again, uh, if you average the furthest visible star, nearest visible star, and Polaris, um, Polaris is only about 8% of that average. And in terms of the furthest visible star, Polaris is only 2.7% of that di uh, distance. So you were technically off by about 3,700% in your estimate of Polaris in terms of its distance. So that's not scoring too well uh, at all. I don't know where you came up with, with that idea. Um, now, the other thing in terms of Polaris, when you also factor in the alleged precession of the equinoxes, uh, considering Polaris has re indeed remained fixed as the North Star for all of recorded history, then the precession of the equinoxes categorically could not be caused by this alleged axial uh, precession. Uh, the, the proof is right there with Polaris. If we were experiencing this uh, wobble, this axial precession over 26,000 years, then we couldn't maintain a, an alignment with any star for 50 or 100 years, or really 200 at the very most, just due to moving one degree every 72 years. This 
absolutely most certainly would have been noted by astronomers uh, just as the very minor changes in equatorial stars over long periods have been noted by astronomers yet Polaris remains fixed meaning the cause for the uh, precession of the equinoxes has nothing to do with uh, axial precession whatsoever it's something entirely different uh, so there you have that I mean the proof is in the pudding there's no even debate um, axial precession does not exist the precession of the equinoxes are not caused by uh, the wobble of the Earth's axis it's just uh, proven by the fact that Polaris doesn't uh, change that the North Polar axis doesn't uh, regress through its path one degree every 72 years it just doesn't happen so there you have that uh, but yeah, being 3,700% wrong in terms of your claims about Polaris being the most distant star, I mean, what really, like, what qualifies you at all to talk about this? I mean, do you just make stuff up and run with it? And, I mean, are you going to retract that? Are you going to correct that? Are you going to come up with any sort of rebuttal as to how Polaris remains fixed above the North Pole? Are you going to come up with any sort of idea as to how uh, a vacuum pushes against our atmosphere with enough force to cause 14.7 uh, pounds of pressure per square inch at sea level? Um, how does a vacuum push against anything? How does zero uh, force uh, pressurize a gaseous body that sh should be in vacuo? And you say it's this theory of gravity that's nothing more than the dream of a fart. It is a, a theory dreamed up by Einstein. And for some reason, you think that because Einstein thought something, then it's true. Well, uh, I mean, that makes you makes it so that you really need to start uh, checking your premises uh, because. Relativity, space-time, gravity, Big Bang, dark matter, dark energy, great attractor, higgs Bosom particle, uh, einstein rosen bridges all of that hogwash, black holes, uh, all of that is just theoretical nonsense. Nuclear bombs, atoms, splitting of atoms, uh, every last bit of this is uh, scientism propaganda, period. Average star in terms of science, this is scientific understanding. The average star is 4.3 light years from the Earth. This is the oh. scientific knowledge. I'm just saying this is what's out there, and That's everyone the can verify this. Star. The average closest. star is 4.3 light years away. The North Star is said to be 433.8 light years away. That's over 100 times further away. So, Jaren, this is what I mean with the Flat Earth community, because all night you've been saying I'm not researched. Look, I'm very well researched in a way because I, I studied this stuff in school. I, look, I was always top of my class, Jaren. I'm not just anyone. I'm trying to look, wrong. The, the North Star is 100 times further away than the average star. So you can't just say it's just like all the other ones. It's not true. You, what you're saying is completely false, Zach. The, the closest star to us is four, is four light years away. The closest star. Okay, so when you say the average star, the average star is a couple thousand light years, could be a million light years. What stars are you considering when you're taking an average? You're talking about all the stars? The well, That doesn't make any sense. Some stars are billions some of light years away. Some are further away. Yes. Yeah, some stars are billions of light years away. What do you mean? The you North Star is special. It's a lot more distant than the majority of stars in the sky. Anyone can look this up. Look, if you're in the flat Earth and, and you're into, into this debate right now, look it up after Jaren is a minor done talking. The furthest, well, you just... No, the furthest star is known, according to the model, is 13.3 billion light years away. So that's... Okay, so that's take an average. Billion. The average isn't going to come out to four. The North Star is 
you said is how many, babe? How many million? It's between 400 years? and 500. But millions. So no, wait. no, no. The North Star is 400 or 500 light years away. Okay, so that's. But that's, that's not an average. That is, it's a, it's a very. The North Star is oh. also. I, I forget what they call it in space. It's in a special spot too, supposedly right above the North Pole. But but <laughs> the fact yeah. that it is so distant is the reason it appears to never move in the sky. And the point is, is I hear a lot of flat Earth channels saying that the North Star never moves, and that is proof that we're stationary. But if well, you look at the mathematics of how far away it is, it's explained why it is what it is. And there's a reason sailors have used it for a thousand years and, and probably longer than that to sail the oceans. You, you, you're basically wrecking your channel right now because this is going to be repeated over and over again. You're going to get shown that you had no clue what you're talking about. So I'm just telling you, I would stop talking about that. Look up the things you're saying first. Don't look up I've, and don't look up things that support what you were taught in school because that's what well, you're... Even he's not, he's not talking about anything that's close to being correct. The North Star being at the center and not moving has absolutely zero to do with its distance from Earth. Nothing. It's because we're tilted and spinning. That's it's what It's because we're thinking. tilted and the axis of the Earth is pointed at the North Star. Yeah. It wouldn't matter if it was the closest star or the furthest star. It would still be at that spot and not move. It has nothing to do with its distance. Mm -mm. And it's it's actually on a lower end. It's actually on the It has everything to do with its distance because that's how perspective works. It's like if you're standing in front of a tree and you take a step to the right, it looks like the tree, now you're not looking at the tree anymore. But if you're a great distance away and you take yeah, a step to the right, the yeah, tree's parallax. still right in front of you. Yeah, parallax, but there is no parallax in the stars. It's not noticeable by the human eye. It's detectable by equipment, but it's not, it's not, the human eye can't d decipher that. It has nothing to do with what you're talking about. This is an observable fact of the world we live in. Flat Earth does not want to recognize this. They just want to ignore it. And people such as Eric Dubé, who use false evidence to make their points, Eric Dubé claims that it's just not true, that the stars don't rotate in opposite directions and opposite hemispheres, which is a lie. They do. It's proven. There's all sorts of video evidence you can look at to see. See, that, that's the difficulty with the Flat Earth research. It requires us to have resources to travel to these places to observe it with our own eyes, but there's people that have done the work. They've documented the, st the stars, the sky, and you can see. You see different stars rotating in op opposite directions in opposite hemispheres. The other point I brought up to Jaronism. A sun's light, a star's light, it has unlimited distance. If the earth was flat and there was a star above it, which is the sun, it would light up the whole earth. The sun is not a lamp. The sun's light doesn't just go off a certain distance. You could never have half the world in light and half the world in darkness on a flat earth. It would either all be light or all be dark at once. I don't even think there would be time zones. And then using mathematics. And I, and I realize Jaronism is very much against mathematics. But using mathematics, it proves the flat earth false. Jaronism just brushed over the point I made last night. On the flat earth map, if you fly from Johannesburg, South Africa to Sydney, Australia, on the flat earth map, you would fly over Asia. When in reality, everyone who takes that flight flies over the ocean the whole time. And not only that, on the flat earth map, doing the mathematics, the flight from Johannesburg to Sydney, would take twice as long as it takes in reality on the flat earth. If you do the mathematics of what is shown on the flat earth map, the flight would take twice as long as it actually takes. And what's really sad is when I made this video, some flat earther has been spamming flights of flights from Johannesburg that have stops that go to other places and saying, see, this time's about the same. I mean, that, that's what's wrong with the Flat Earth community right there. Just that somebody's even that dumb to try to make that argument. I'm talking about how the nonstop flight flies over the ocean in about 13 hours time. And on the Flat Earth map, if you do the mathematics, based on the rate of travel for a commercial air flight, it would take over 22 hours, which it does not. This person went and found flights from Johannesburg to Sydney that have layovers in other cities and said, see, these flights take that long. 
I mean, how can you even... It's just so embarrassing to even try to make that argument. We're talking about a nonstop flight over the ocean versus flights that have layovers, destinations before it goes there. And see, someone in the flat Earth thinks that this is an argument. They think that that proves the Earth is flat. A completely nonsensical, ridiculous, horribly thought out argument. So anyway, last night I had to listen to Jaronism and his wife just keep saying, this isn't true, this isn't true, when in fact it is true. It's observable, it's documented. And, uh, you know, it was Jaronism's show, so I was polite the whole time, and I didn't even, sometimes I just let stuff go and didn't even say anything in the back. Like at the beginning, he introduced me by saying that my flat earth research is horrendous, and it's obvious I haven't done the homework. Well... I've done plenty of homework, and I know things that Jaronism, even after spending all these years, still doesn't know. I had to make the point to him that, yes, the moon is a sphere because only a spherical shape can have phases like the moon goes through. He tried to argue that the moon was a two-dimensional object. A two-dimensional object cannot go through phases. Has to be a sphere. And Jaronism has admitted many times before, and he admitted again last night, he has... No idea what causes the orbit of the sun or moon. So this is my point. Why are people so passionate about this subject that they cannot prove, and to try and prove in their mind, they have to deny reality? So I just want to play this clip of him and his wife denying that boats go beyond the horizon. We can see them go over the horizon Something that anyone can observe from any beach in the world. But they wanted to deny it and say that this doesn't happen. Just listen here, truth seeker. And then we're going to watch a clip of a boat going over the horizon. Something everyone can observe. Things such as boats going over the horizon, the way the sun rises, the sun sets. These are the very real proofs that we live on a spherical earth. Okay, exactly. So, but you're saying that it, it that it bends into a ball, right? Where's the evidence of the, that? You can't have both of those. Things. Where's the Where is there any kind of experiment, lab experiment? Show me an example of water. Well, that's what That's what we're seeing when when a ship goes beyond the horizon. Okay, we're see, seeing it go the, around. That is the curvature. Okay, here's the thing, Zach. This I've is what I've done like videos. No research going on. I've done videos. Well, Hold on. So have other people that will show you that the boats never go over the curvature. Both. So his wife kept saying that too. She kept like I'd make points and she'd go, "Oh, that's so sad. It just shows you haven't done any research." And I just kept thinking, "What what research are they doing? Are they only looking at evidence that fits their false delusional worldview that the Earth is flat?" You know, it's funny that you would mention that in terms of uh, only observing or only researching things that fit your paradigm because that's exactly the opposite of what we're doing. Uh, we're looking at data and uh, following the data where it leads us and uh, doing away with preconceived notions or laws like the Copernican principle. And when Missa says things, she fit like things like it's so sad because you haven't researched this is because, well, for example, there is no curvature and um, there's tons of experiments and tons of examples that you can point to which prove this, yet people such as yourself are really guilty of exactly what you just um, claimed that they've been doing. So essentially, um, the heliocentric model relies on uh, ignoring observations and data that disagree with your model and only allowing for consideration observations and data that aligns with your model and if any any data or experiment uh, experimental results come back that uh, disagree with your model then it is buried by modern science uh, unfortunately and there's lots of examples you can cite for that. But it is really ironic and it is sad because um, it, is, it is the Globe Earth proponents who are refusing to participate in the scientific method, which is uh, trying to prove to yourself whether or not there's curvature. And once you've proven to yourself that there is no curvature, then um, 
it's really sort of difficult and ironic to have people such as yourself accusing us of doing exactly what you're doing, which is uh, ignoring evidence and only uh, examining with your blinders on, only examining stuff that you feel aligns with your model. Uh, so you'll assume that there's curvature, yet when it's measured for, it doesn't exist, and you say that we're somehow, you know, being biased here, right? I mean, how is that being how is that being biased uh, by taking data and, much to our surprise at least it was for me at first, much to my surprise, that uh, there is in fact no curvature and no axial rotation. So there is no cherry picking, there is no sort of uh, confirmation bias involved. It's uh, actually uh, very simple. It's as simple as uh, revisiting the assumptions that were crammed into our psyche as uh, children. Because this is what it is. To think the Earth is flat in 2017, where we now are, you have to truly be delusional. There is no evidence that the Earth is flat. There is all sorts of evidence that the Earth is a sphere. <laughs> there's no evidence that the Earth is flat, and there's all sorts of evidence that the Earth is a sphere, right? That's what you claim. Um, actually, I'll correct you, and what you should have said is that uh, there is no evidence that the Earth is flat and stationary, while there's all sorts of evidence that the Earth is a spinning sphere in the vacuum of space, orbiting the sun, orbiting the galaxy, flying through the cosmos at a gazillion miles an hour. Um, I beg to differ, though. This is sort of like the old ostrich burying his head in the sand, saying there is no evidence of this stampede of buffaloes coming my way. There is no evidence. I don't see it, right? So uh, a couple things I'll just mention is the fact that there is no curvature to say 50 or 60 miles of standing water proves that the Earth couldn't be a sphere with the proportions of, uh, you know, 4,000 mile radius. Uh, also, there's lots of experiments that you could do uh, or look at and research uh, that prove that the Earth is stationary. Uh, Aries failure, Michelson Moore, Michelson Gailey, the Sanyak experiment, or just uh, fire a potato gun perfectly vertically into the air and see if it comes back at the same angle that it went up. Oh, I see that one. I thought that was coming straight down. Now, a little over this way. Oh! <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, but there's all sorts of evidence that the Earth is stationary and doesn't have any curvature. Now, are you going to cite some evidence that the Earth is, in fact, a spinning sphere in the vacuum of space, orbiting the sun, orbiting the galaxy? Or are you just going to leave it at your claim and just move on? And for people who don't understand mathematics, which is over 95% of the population, which is why so many people have been sucked into the flat Earth psyop, for people who don't understand mathematics, it becomes all the more challenging to understand the spherical nature. For example, if you listened to the debate last night, Jaronism kept making the point that sea level doesn't make any sense on a spherical Earth. He's saying if there's curvature from Los Angeles to New York, cities that both come to the coast to sea level, he's saying that's impossible on a spherical Earth. And I was saying to him, no, Jaronism, it's not impossible. Think of a ball, think of, you know, the ocean wrapping around the spherical Earth because of gravity, which pulls everything towards the center of its math. Okay, this is where I would uh, disagree with Jaron just a little bit. Um, I would say that uh, sea level makes perfect sense on a spherical Earth if you assume that the Earth is a sphere. Okay, so that's you have to have that assumption first. Now, other than that, it makes no sense whatsoever uh, due to this uh, gravity that you, uh, you know, Zachary and other globe heads love to point to as evidence of this spherical Earth and sea level. Now, of course, on a spherical Earth, sea level, there's nothing level about it. It's a uh, mean curve. Uh, so sea level is just a complete misnomer for some reason that people have used. So is the word horizon uh, or the word horizontal, uh, whichever one. Both horizon, horizontal, sea level, all of those are huge misnomers uh, assuming that the Earth is a sphere. Now, the other thing that you have to consider here 
here is gravity, which has never been proven ever. It is a theory that was uh, constructed uh, with the presumption that the Earth is the sphere in outer space. Uh, gravity is what allows for you to remain stuck to the side of a spinning sphere. It allows the uh, atmosphere to remain adjacent to a vacuum. It allows the moon to uh, orbit around the Earth connected to the Earth by nothing but a vacuum. Uh, uh, gravity is a uh, mass attracting mass, essentially. Now, you can't demonstrate this anywhere in reality unless there's magnetism involved. Certainly, you can demonstrate uh, mass being attracted to mass when there's magnetism involved, but uh, you, can, you can sit there all day long. I don't care how massive two objects are. They're never going to attract each other, uh, which is why the entire uh, Cavendish experiments from hundreds of years ago were a lie. Nobody's been able to uh, replicate that uh, so-called experiment, and uh, even if the lead balls in his glorified tool shed did move uh, there's a million other explanations other than gravity uh, gravity does not exist gravity is a figment of uh, theory it's a figment of the imagination of theoretical physicists to apologize or allow for us to live on a spinning sphere but it isn't proof of anything uh, what goes up must come down is a certainty here on the physical plane and gravity is an explanation to explain this on a spherical earth so, um, you know, again, I, I do sort of disagree with Jaren that, yes, okay, if we assume that the Earth is a sphere, then sea level is a mean curve. However, um, where I'm with Jaren on this is that the Earth isn't a damn sphere, for crying out loud. It's a plane, and so sea level is actually level. The horizon is actually horizontal. And um, there, there's so much evidence to, to prove this. Um, you know, we've, between so many of us, we've made thousands of hours of videos proving all of this disproving curvature, disproving axial rotation, proving that there is no curvature, proving that we're stationary, and yet we're stuck with people saying, um, you know, pointing to gravity as proof of something, when gravity is a theory that was dreamed up by the dead shill Einstein. level and surrounding the spherical earth he doesn't understand how there can be curvature and two points be level on a sphere think about it there's a ball right all the water is being pulled the space where water meets what we call land that's what we refer to as sea level all the water is pulled evenly around the ball that's why it's at sea level the same height and the fact that it's all pulled around the spherical Earth <laughs> is the reality of this world we live in. Okay, Zachary K. Hubbard. So you're saying, uh, first of all, you're just way off. Any uh, theoretical physicist, globehead theoretical physicist, would just beat you with his uh, gravitational device if he heard you say that, uh, you know, space was causing all of the water to be pulled toward the sphere. Uh, physicists describe gravity as an acceleration, not as a f pulling or pushing force. And essentially what you're saying uh, is, is also wrong according to theoretical physics. Um, gravity is allegedly the warping of space-time by the mass of the Earth. Uh, causing the rectilinear state of space-time to warp and sort of curve around the massive Earth, um, which causes sort of a displacement of space-time. You know, like if you were to shove a beach ball underwater, it's going to displace a certain amount of water. Gra uh, gravity is sort of the same thing in a sense that the mass of the Earth is displacing or warping space-time. Now, space-time uh, is a theory, and it's another one of those theories by Einstein that people point to as proof of something, but it is merely the imaginings of a single person. Um, you're claiming that uh, nothing, a vacuum, is pushing against our atmosphere when technically our atmosphere should be evaporated out into the infinitude of space uh, 
assuming the heliocentric model, but you're saying that a vacuum is pushing down towards the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is actually what's pushing down on the sea at sea level with about 14.7 pounds of pressure per square inch. Um, so here's a it, gravity has really big problems with it because the earth is allegedly spinning at uh, 1037 and a half miles an hour at the equator while spinning 0, 0.0 miles per hour at the north pole according to you now at the north pole uh, an observer or say a ton of coffee would be uh, on top of the axis parallel with the axis spinning 0, 0.0 miles per hour or it, technically half the speed as an hour hand on a clock now on the other hand an observer or a ton of coffee at the equator uh, should be spinning like I said over a thousand miles per hour uh, standing 4,000 miles away from the axis of rotation underfoot perpendicular to the axis while uh, zipping along that parabolic curve of the earth uh, dropping 135 miles per hour compared to a tangent line from the base point okay and so uh, gravity is allegedly powerful enough to keep all of the waters of the oceans stuck to the side of a sphere spinning a thousand miles an hour at the equator and yet there is no major uh, difference between uh, weight on a scale between the equator and the uh, North Pole so this right here debunks the theory of gravity uh, people or a ton of coffee should weigh hundreds of thousands of times more at the North Pole due to the lack of centrifugal force uh, which is generated at the equator um, gravity is only necessary if you assume that the earth is a spinning sphere in outer space and since there's no curvature nor is the earth spinning then gravity is unnecessary it is a phantom of theory and um, it, it actually doesn't exist density and buoyancy is what causes things to you know higher density objects to fall lower density objects to rise such as a helium balloon and the nudge uh, for higher density objects to fall is not caused by gravity, which is theoretical nonsense, but it is by ca it is caused by uh, electromagnetic forces. Uh, again, I've touched on this already in this video, but the uh, Earth holds a static electric charge, and uh, static electric charge is always attractant or attractive, uh, regardless of the uh, polarity or the charge of the object that it is attracting. And so there you have the necessary downward tendency or nudge for higher density objects to fall, lower density gases like helium or hot air balloons to rise. Uh, so with all that being said, uh, you know, you must prove the spinning spherical Earth first before you can point to gravity as anything. Uh, gravity doesn't exist, period. Prove it otherwise. There is no evidence for gravity. It is theory. And for anyone who just denies that because they can't understand it, that doesn't make the earth flat. You know, I, I just could not get behind how Jaren is. I couldn't even understand how he was so perplexed by what sea level is on a spherical earth. Everyone should be able to understand what we're told. Even if you disagree with it, you should understand the model. If there's a spherical earth and there's water that's the majority of the planet, and it's all being pulled towards the center, it's going to become level, you know, as it does in this world. Okay, so here we go, Zachary K. Hubbard. We're going to define level. Uh, level is uh, used as a noun, a horizontal plane or line with respect to the distance above or below a given point. Uh, two, a position on a real or imaginary scale of amount, quantity, extent, or quality. Uh, example, a high level of unemployment. Uh, synonyms, quantity, amount, extent, measure, degree, volume, size, magnitude, intensity, and proportion. Quote, a high level of unemployment. It can be used as an adjective, having a flat and even surface without slopes or bumps. Example, we had reached level ground. Synonyms, flat, smooth, even, uniform, plain, flush, plumb. 
two at the same height as someone or something else. His eyes were level with hers. Synonyms aligned with, on the same level as, on a level with, at the same height as, in line with. Example, his eyes were level with hers. Verb, a given flat and even surface to. Example, or rather give a flat and even surface to. Example, contractors started leveling the ground for new for the new power station. Uh, synonyms, make level, level out, level off, make even, even out, make flat, flatten, smooth, smooth out, make uniform, tilt the pan to level the mixture, as an example. Uh, secondly, as a verb, begin to fly horizontally after climbing or diving. Okay, so that was level. Now, Let's go into the uh, definition of mean curvature, which is what you believe C level is. Mathematics, the mean curvature of H of a surface S is an extrinsic measure of curvature that comes from differential geometry and that locally describes the curvature of an embedded surface in some ambient space such as Euclidean space. The concept was introduced by Sophie Germain in her work on elasticity theory. It is important in the analysis of mineral surfaces which have a mean curvature zero and the analysis of physical interfaces between fluids such as soap films, which by the young Laplace equation have constant mean curvature. Definition. Let P be a point on the surface S. Each plane through P containing the normal line to S cuts S in a plane curve. Fixing a choice of unit normal gives a signed curvature to that curve. As the plane is rotated, always containing the normal line, that curvature can vary, and the maximal curvature and minimal curvature uh, K2 and K1, sorry, uh, maximal, maximal curvature K1 and minimal curvature K2 are known as the principal curvatures of S. The mean curvature at P epsilon S is the average of the principal curvatures. Spivac 1999, Volume 3, Chapter 2, hence the name, H equals 1 over 2 times K1 plus K2. More generally, Spivac 1999, Volume 4, Chapter 7, for a hypersurface T, the mean curvature given as H equals 1 over N omega, and I just don't even know how to read that, I'm sorry, I'm not getting into all that. More abstractly, the mean curvature is the trace of the second fundamental form divided by N, or equivalently, the shape operator. Additionally, the mean curvature H may be written in terms of the covariance derivative as H uh, something N equals GIJ upside down triangle I upside down triangle J times X, using the Gauss Weingarten relations where X times X is a smoothly embedded hypersurface, uh, something N, a unit normal vector, or n and beyond, a unit normal vector, and g i j, the metric tensor, a surface is a minimal surface if and only the mean curvature is zero. Furthermore, a surface which evolves under the mean curvature of the surface S is said to obey a heat type equation called the mean curvature flow equation. The sphere is the only embedded surface of constant positive mean curvature without boundary or singularities. However, the result is not true when the condition, quote, embedded surface, unquote, is weakened to, quote, immersed surface, end quote. So, that was the definition of mean curvature. Uh, basically, uh, it's absolutely nothing like what you described. Uh, it's actually very complex mathematics to figure up mean curvature, and in fact, it makes a whole lot more sense to uh, this speaker that sea level is level, the horizon is horizontal, and that mean curvature is something that uh, can theoretically be applied to a hypothetically spherical Earth, but is nothing of the sort level based on the definitions. So by definition, level and mean curvature are mutually exclusives, okay? So let's please stop using the term sea level if you're a glober, uh, and you're gonna have to change that because it, uh, it's, it's an oxymoron. Sea uh, level in a globe earth sense is an oxymoron. That's like, that's like uh, saying curve level. Yeah, it's a curve level, uh-huh. Two opposite things, two mutually exclusive uh, ideas, cannot be uh, used in scientific arguments for the shape of the Earth. I'm sorry. I, I call total foul on the phrase sea level in a uh, spherical Earth hypothesis. There's all sorts of landmass below the ocean, you know, that once upon a time was above the ocean. But over time, the water level has been rising because we're coming out of an ice age. Okay, I don't disagree with you that uh, there are areas of the Earth that were once above sea level that are now below sea level. This may or may not be because we're coming out of an ice age. Uh, the point is, is that uh, flooding is not exclusive to a sphere. Okay? Um, there are lots of uh, what appear to be ancient uh, sites that are, you know, very, very deep in the ocean, uh, off the coast of China and, and other places. Ancient civilizations are 
found, you know, remnants are found underwater, um, which does lend some credence to the great flood stories and such uh, told of in all ancient cultures, not just the uh, Judeo-Christian sort of biblical culture, but all ancient cultures uh, tell ancient, ancient uh, tales, even myths of a worldwide flood. And so this is not at all exclusive to a sphere whatsoever. Now, what you're looking at here is an animation of the spinning spherical Earth without any ocean. So uh, if you can imagine, you know, hypothetically, the spherical Earth with all of the water uh, totally sucked out of it, it's not very spherical anymore, is it? And so this really does uh, raise some questions about this whole uh, shtick of gravity that it is this sort of uh, leveling factor uh, or creative force in all of the universe, you know, mashing together and attracting together mass and mashing it into perfect spheres, yet somehow the, uh, you know, the high density rock and lava uh, underneath the water is certainly not spherical whatsoever. Uh, it looks more like a misshapen asteroid. And it is the allegedly the water that fills it up that makes it, you know, this perfect sphere. Now, honestly, this doesn't make any sense in a gravitic uh, situation. You know, they claim that the Earth is uh, so many billions of years old and uh, it formed out of essentially uh, stardust coalescing into planet objects, planet sized objects that are held to the sun by gravity, you know, held into their orbits by gravity. And one of the biggest problems with this is that the gases that allegedly formed the planets um, were, you know, more or less in the same spot where the planets formed. Uh, how was gravity holding those gases in, in place in this infinite vacuum uh, when a planet-sized object is needed to maintain a gravitic relationship between the sun? It's totally non sequitur. Uh, planet formations disprove uh, the heliocentric model. But these gases allegedly coalesced into large objects which were molten sort of states, uh, high pressures, high, vul you know, high volcanism, uh, sort of a very uh, changing, almost fluid earth, and eventually coalescing and cooling into the, you know, the rock and metal and, and this, that sort of thing that we're used to today. And uh, somehow liquid water is able to stick to the surface because it's far enough away from the host star to where water isn't boiled away. Uh, it also has the correct barometric pressure so that uh, water isn't boiled away. Uh, it's also not so distant from the host star that the liquid state water is impossible. All the water would be frozen. Uh, or if the barometric pressure is too high, then liquid uh, water is impossible. So, you know, according to all of this heliocentric theory, the, the globular Earth with uh, liquid water is a very sort of lucky situation to begin with there's lots and lots of very lucky coincidences involved with the heliocentric theory I would invite you to check out some of my other videos uh, to look more into that uh, but you know at the end of the day the earth isn't a sphere even according to the globe earthers it's not a sphere it's sort of this you know bizarre shaped uh, asteroid looking thing and yet when you fill up fill it up with water uh, that mean curve makes it a perfect sphere, a perfectly level curve, right? So, um, all of this theory that you believe in starts with the Big Bang and ends with gravity, and there is no proof for either of those. Uh, you have to go with the assumption that the Earth is a spinning sphere, and when measured for, there isn't any curvature nor axial rotation, and so this whole idea of gravity pulling water towards the center mass of the Earth uh, and gravity shaping the Earth into a perfect sphere is, is malarkey even according to the uh, very uh, heliocentric model. You know, suck out the oceans and you do not have anything close to a sphere. And again, having an ice age and floods or earthquakes that cause entire uh, shelves of tectonic plates to, you know, drop or shift, none of that is exclusive to a sphere. 
at all. So, I mean, that, that's what I mean when I say that Globe Earthers uh, seem to think that everything that happens under the sun is, is exclusive to a sphere. Well, the sky is blue, therefore the Earth is a sphere. Uh, the moon appears to be a sphere, therefore the Earth is a sphere. Uh, water is level, therefore the Earth is a sphere. Uh, what goes up must come down, therefore the Earth is a sphere. Whatever. I mean, jeez. Right? So water constantly rising, more and more land masses getting covered up. But as it rises, it all comes to the same height, and that's what we call sea level. So anyway, we just heard them say that there's no evidence that a ship sets over the horizon. Let's just finish by watching this. And again, you want four more proofs that the Earth is a sphere and not flat. I'm going to link all of these short videos in the description. They're all undeniable. Okay, so uh, let me get this straight. You're saying that there are four things that easily prove that the Earth is a spinning sphere in outer space, um, yet you refuse to list them. You give links. Um, if they're so simple and undeniable, why don't you just rattle them off real quick? Um, is it because you don't understand them, or are they, uh, are they as undeniable as your theory about the North Pole star being the most distant star, which is why it remains fixed above the North Polar axis for all of history, when in fact you were over 3,000% wrong in your uh, estimation of the, the distance of Polaris being the most distant star? So, in other words, uh, the most distant visible star, according to the heliocentric model, is 3,700% uh, further than Polaris is alleged to be. So that's how far off you were on that. Is it, are they as undeniable as that god-awful nonsense that you pulled out of your rear end? I don't even know where you came up with that. If something so simple, such as a spinning sphere, it would be easy to prove for a child. Uh, yet you have to refer to these different videos and you can't even uh, give even just a rapid-fire explanation of what it is, you know, exactly that you're talking about. So, you know, whatever. That doesn't, that doesn't do your argument any justice. Um, you won't even describe these proofs that you're talking about. Um, and I would submit it's because either you don't understand them or they are not proofs. And I, I refuse to look at the links. And, and you had mentioned uh, the ships going over the horizon. Um, that also is not exclusive to a sphere. Um, the laws of perspective dictate that the uh, bottom portion of the ship will appear to merge with the horizon uh, prior to the top portion of the ship. Then, of course, you have atmospheric lensing, which causes sort of a uh, mirage situation uh, the further out the ship gets, where you get sort of a reflection mirror image of the, uh, you know, that's a whole other topic, but there's atmospheric distortion that also leads us to believe that a ship is going over a curve when it recedes from our view. Uh, however, um, when you actually uh, look at this objectively, um, you'll realize that uh, the laws of perspective coupled with atmospheric lensing uh, absolutely 100% explain why ships appear to go over a curve. Um, it is sort of an optical illusion coupled with the laws of perspective and the fact that not only are our eyes convex lenses, but we also um, all walk around with a giant atmospheric convex lens all the way around us. And when a ship goes out to sea, uh, the atmospheric uh, particulates and, and, st and such are uh, much more prevalent than, say, in the desert. And so uh, it is understandable why Christopher Columbus would have thought, you know, uh, the, the mass of ships uh, receding uh, after the hull was proof of a spherical Earth. Uh, however, if you do study this, and study the things that I've mentioned, atmospheric lensing, atmospheric refraction, and the actual laws of perspective, um, I would suggest maybe read Zetetic Astronomy for some very good uh, explanations of this and proofs of this. Um, it all makes perfect sense upon a plane, and um, when you point to things like the Chicago skyline from over 50 miles away across Lake Michigan, um, that is uh, excellent proof that the Earth isn't a sphere, uh, because again, water always maintains its level, uh, even if you consider that level a curve, um, th there is th that curvature doesn't exist, it is actually level. 
this is also proven by um, radio shots that have been verified at over 100 miles away, uh, which is uh, the you know radio towers, radio frequency towers that are transmitting and receiving data back and forth need direct line of sight. Uh, so it's not like they can bounce it off of the ionosphere or a satellite to get these 100 mile shots, direct line of sight shots between radio towers. Uh, so you know the evidence is all over the place. You just um, you got to get you have to unbury your head from the sand. Uh, or your rear uh, in order to understand this and uh, th there's nothing to be ashamed of because it is simply participating in the scientific method. And you know what? I tried to make one other point to Jaronism last night that he played naive on. I was explaining how Flat Earth videos don't get suppressed. You look at all the Flat Earth channels, their videos have big views, tons of likes, hardly any dislikes. Anytime you make a video disproving the Flat Earth PSYOP, it gets attacked by trolls and bots. Okay, so let me prove to you that you're 100% uh, wrong about this and that in fact it is the uh, mainstream channels which are being propped up by uh, YouTube and Google and the actual truth, you know, the static plane truth channels that are, are indeed being suppressed. Um, we're having our view counts removed, we're having our subscribers removed, uh, we're having our uh, videos being hard to find even by our subscribers and I'll prove you this real quick now I don't have that many subscribers I've got uh, about 17,000 and some changed subscribers but what my point is, is if you go into uh, my videos um, then we'll just like I'll show you my video manager here um, you'll notice that a lot of the videos will even go back some distance in time this is from uh, the 11th so you know, that had been uh, about a week or so ago, over a week ago, uh, getting 4,000 views. Now, this has all changed recently since November, where it used to be, if I released a video, at least, you know, uh, within a week or two, my subscribers would have seen it, right? And, um, yeah, I do have some videos that get big hits. Like, for example, uh, we'll go back to uh, October of 2016, the uh, the documentary that I did uh, so far right now has 158,000 views, which is okay. Um, and it you know it doesn't have the this awesome like to unlike ratio that you claim that we have. Now I will say that there are bots out there and people such as Tim Osman who claim to have over 500 YouTube accounts who are doing things like this to videos in order to. Uh, you know make them look bad but uh, there are situations where I'll put out videos that have uh, hundreds of likes to one dislike and so that does happen because uh, what we're talking about happens to be the truth but just to give you an example of where um, this was in October of 2016 and uh, this video performed uh, fairly well it was an hour and 13 minute long documentary um, which was part one of a series uh, part two of the series which I released just about a, a week or two later um, got has now gotten half the views as that that was still in October so that one did pretty well then you can see this third one eh, had a copyright strike issue so that one still only has 5,000 views mind you I do have uh, over 17,000 subscribers not bragging about this but typically you'll see uh, at least your subscribers um, your subscriber base count viewing the video over a period of three or four months eventually okay um, now going into the next section of the same documentary series uh, that one did even worse than the second part uh, with now this was still an end of October and I think this was around the time of the algorithm change got 20,000 views Okay, and then the final section of the documentary series, which happened uh, November 3rd, uh, did a little bit better than the, than the uh, fourth section of the uh, documentary series. Then you can see after November, everything just sort of really goes down. Um, I, you know, very rarely do you see a video that even exceeds 10,000 hits on my channel 
when uh, technically, you know, I should be seeing, you know, around 20,000 hits after a few weeks or a month on uh, video. Now, another thing that they've done is they've, uh, YouTube is actually removing view counts from videos, and I'll just show you a uh, private video real quick that I know for a fact had at least three or four views at one point in the past when I posted it, and that specific video has gone down to zero. Okay, so here it is. Here is the uh, video. Which uh, went from at least a few views down to zero. And so what that tells me is it confirms uh, things that I've noticed about videos, which, uh, you know, I do sort of keep track of this because I spend a lot of time on this. And it seems like I'll, I'll have videos where I remember uh, performing very well like uh, having tens of thousands of hits and then finding that video uh, dropping down to like less than 5,000 hits. And you could say that it's all in my head, maybe I'm remembering incorrectly, but when I see that one single private video going from several views down to zero, uh, that really just proves to me that uh, YouTube is removing view counts from videos. Okay, and I don't hear any um, mainstream channels complaining about this, although there are mainstream channels complaining about, you know, the whole subscriber uh, ring the bell thing and whatnot. But um, for you to claim that Glober Earth Truth channels are being suppressed while Static Plane Truth channels are being uh, bolstered is uh, ridiculous. Now, what I will say is that the uh, Static Plane Falsity channels, like the ones who are pushing misinformation and poor information, are getting uh, re really, really heavily uh, trafficked. Uh, so are the channels that are brand new channels who are merely re-uploading content of uh, others from a year ago are getting uh, a whole lot of exposure. But in terms of the content creators who are uh, really just kicking the crap out of the heliocentric model and proving things well, are, are getting definitely uh, unfavorable uh, treatment from Google YouTube. One example would be one of my favorite channels is My Perspective, uh, who is uh, now totally down and a few months ago had to had all their videos removed. Another big one was ODD TV or ODD Reality now that uh, had his channel completely taken down. So um, you don't see that happening with, uh, you know, Glober channels. Um, I'm finding it so hard to upload a video due to just the most ridiculous copyright claims and having to dispute things that are well within the uh, realm of the Fair Use uh, Act laws. So, hmm. and, you know, I've proven that to myself at least. I've shown it, uh, at least subscribers are being unsubscribed without their consent. And also, the people who are subscribed to my channel are finding it hard to find my videos, um, which that you know that did not used to be the case. That's all very recent, and um, you'll see channels who are uh, pro globe proponent channels uh, making meteoric rises, uh, you know, just uh, doing very very well all of a sudden. And you know, I totally disagree. I think that you are just uh, really way off base on this one. And I'd, would you care to provide any evidence of uh, your claim or you just make claims and that's it? Because YouTube is here to attack truth and help spread lies and disinfo, which all of us who are real truth seekers and speakers know. But Jaronism, he just wanted to shrug this off and just say, oh, well, <laughs> it's because he's invested in a lie. Jaronism has invested in a lie. Okay, I'm just going to have to totally disagree with you on that. I've known uh, Jaron, had many long talks with Jaronism uh, for the last almost two years, and he is absolutely not invested in a lie. Um, that is uh, the opposite of the truth. That makes you a liar. Um, what he's invested in and what many others, such as myself and thousands of others, have invested themselves in is the pursuit of truth. And what we found is that the uh, theoretical uh, model of all things that we've been taught you know, our entire lives are the lie. And um, unfortunately, you, you are unable to see the truth right under your nose, directly underneath your feet, uh, because of this deception. Um, 
you are incapable of theorizing just for argument's sake uh, hypotheses that fall outside of your current belief system and so um, you know Jaron's motto is sort of uh, you know be kind don't lie to each other open your mind there's truth inside um, he's committed himself to and as well as myself uh, completely reevaluating everything that we thought uh, was true starting with the very ground that we walk upon and um, what we found you know much to our surprise and uh, without any contrary evidence over the last two years that um, indeed uh, theoretical sciences theoretical physics the big bang theory gravity dark matter dark energy galaxies all of this is um, theoretical folly and uh, unfortunately you know we are invested in the truth uh, in spite of the uh, repercussions it has on our personal lives, on our business lives, on our reputations. And uh, frankly, you know, uh, we don't give a damn, my dear, because uh, we're, we're standing up for the truth. Um, do you really think that people would put their reputations at stake? I know that I wouldn't put my reputation at stake for a complete and bogus lie, uh, such as global warming. Uh, so, you know, how dare you? What, that's a complete misrepresentation of everything that uh, Jaronism and, and really the Flat Earth Movement represents. Um, all of the other deceptions in the world, starting from, you know, the Big Bang all the way to the Federal Reserve scam and everything in between, uh, hinges on the Copernican Principle or the heliocentric theory, period, which happens to be the, the greatest deception of all time. Cognitive dissonance is what plagues the flat earth community. They don't want to look at the realities of this world we live in, and they want to delude themselves with a belief that has no evidence. More evidence that the flat earth is a psyop is just how YouTube treats videos that expose the flat earth lines. You know? Jaronism said that all these videos prove nothing. Wrong. They all prove that the earth is a sphere, you know? <laughs> Proof of curvature right here. Proof of how the stars operate on this earth right here. Impossible on a flat earth. Again, proof that the sun could never operate as the flat earth community is saying it operates, like it's a lamp in your room. And again, the mathematics of the flat earth prove it to be false. So let's finish up here by showing a boat going over the horizon. Until next time, Truth Seeker. So what, you can just say proof of this and proof of that. And that proves a thing? Okay, well, proof that the horizon is horizontal. Proof the earth isn't spinning. Oh, I see that one. I thought that was coming straight down. You know, a little over this way. Oh! <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Proof that gravity is a theoretical fantasy. Proof that the mathematics of the spherical earth don't work. So there you go. I just proved all those things. Actually, they have been proven, but you'd have to probably watch a few hundred hours of videos. I've put some cards and links in the description for your uh, convenience. And okay, we don't need to watch boats going over the horizon for the umpteenth time. So um, we'll just go ahead and end it at that. I'll invite you to watch a couple of my uh, documentary series, which again, I have linked up and put cards in for. So um, yeah, this, this whole boats over the horizon thing has been debunked uh, years ago. So um, yeah, doesn't prove a thing. Wish you the best, y'all out there. Uh, who'd like to support this channel you can do so uh, more easily via PayPal to paypal.me slash the Morgyle one uh, or directly through PayPal to J O N E Lance at gmail.com or through fan funding on YouTube on the Morgyle. So anyway, thanks so much for your time. Uh, God bless you all. Spread the word, spread the world and peace. <laughs>